everybody. Hi, all the Julies. As Barb said, my name is Cheryl Vito. I have been doing medical writing for over 25 years. And my two favorite things to write are CSRs and protocols. So I think uh, we'll have a lot of fun today. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is how we're going to turn a protocol and the data that come from the conduct of that protocol into a clear, concise CSR for submission. We'll talk about the specific elements of the CSR, the appendices, which are part of the CSR, which people don't always think of. Uh, we're going to talk a little about different types of statistical outputs and how we handle those results in what we call the back end of the CSR. A little bit more also about phases of drug development, their differences and similarities, and how that plays into your clinical study report at times. And some of the tools that we use in writing, style guides and templates specifically, which are very important. All right, so let's talk a little bit about writing just off the front because it's all, uh, our audience, who we're writing for, what the goals are. The audience is really important for any regulatory document. As you're writing it, you have to think about who's going to be seen. Uh, for CSRs in particular, these go quickly to regulatory review. They get submitted to the FDA, depending on what division you might be using, CEDAR for drugs, CBER for biologics, or CDRH for devices and radiologic health. And there are other national authorities that we also submit this, the clinical study reports to because of so many of our studies now are global. You also may be working with CROs who either are writing the uh, reports for you, or maybe you are CRO and writing the reports for other people, or maybe just reviewing it because you had part of the study conduct. Site personnel very often have to review your CSRs. Uh, for Europe, as a matter of fact, for submission, the principal investigators are required to sign off on your clinical study report. So they're going to have some input, and they actually need to understand what you're saying for them to sign off on it. Right? Uh, there's always internal reviewers for any document that we write. And so the takeaway I think that's important uh, right now is to understand that no matter who is looking at your document, every one of those people should have the same takeaway message. They should all come away with the same foundation and understanding. So that's the key to writing. So there's some things we do to make sure that that happens. We want to use terminology that's familiar to the audience. So make sure that you're using terms that are consistent and sort of standardized uh, regulatory documents. And it's really important that we write to inform rather than to impress. We're not writing a novel. We don't have to use a whole lot of big words or adjectives. We're basically reporting results. We're reporting information about what happened in a clinical study. So we want to be informative. Formatting is very important in regulatory documents. Uh, I can't stress that enough. I, when I first started writing, I always thought, well, the content is all that matters. And that's really absolutely not the case. If you write in a linear fashion and your document flows, you're going to get faster review times. People are going to have a really much clearer picture of what is going on in the information that you're trying to impart. So formatting really helps with that, being consistent with your styles, consistent with the way that you write things. So that's why we'll talk a lot about templates and style guides. Uh, you want to understand things like linking. In CSRs, we link a lot of things. We link tables that are in the text to text in the, t in the body of the CSR. We also link to things outside of the clinical study report. And we'll talk more about the granularity and how that's done, but there are certain conventions around that. We use a certain blue, uh, we do cross-referencing, we do bookmarks. There are all kinds of pre-publishing standards that have to be imparted in your document. And another thing that's really important is letting someone else review your work. This really helped with so many things. I don't know if, if any of you have spent a lot of time writing regulatory documents, but if you have, what you'll know for sure is that you sort of get lost in the document. So I'll be writing a document and think everything that's in my head is being written clearly and concisely in the document. And then I find out sometimes as someone's reviewing it that I maybe didn't get across everything I wanted to. So it's really important to have people review your work, make sure you, that you're uh, really putting down what you mean to say and that you're very clear about what kind of information that you're writing about. It will also find uh, problems with flow and grammar. And there may be questions that come up that you didn't think about that you might want to be concerned about before it goes to any further reviews. So let's talk about style guides and ten. A style guide, if you're not, uh, there are company specific guides that contain the rules for generating a good document within your company. Some companies are big enough to even have style guides for therapeutic areas. But for the most part, most companies are going to have one style guide. And what it does is it really helps to create standardization across all of the documents in any submission that you're going to do. The end result is you're going to have easy-to-read documents that are well-organized, and they look the same. And in some cases, it may look even that the same writer has written all of the documents in the submission, which is really kind of the goal. 
So style guides contain a lot of information. I've seen some that are five pages long, and I've seen some that are 150 pages long. I can tell you that the 150-page style guides are typically written by medical writers because we attention to those types of details are very important to us. It could have information about margins, especially if you're still doing paper submissions. Electronic submissions, that's not so important. But for paper submissions, when you have to bind, actual bind paper, uh, the margins are kind of critical. Things about like font sizes, uh, font type sizes, spacing, all of that is very important to how your documents are standardized. Headers and footers, how they're handled both inside your document as well as things like tables and figures. So there's all kinds of information that you can find in a style. Your template is a step-by-step -step example of your document, both your formatting and your text. So it should have your formatting embedded into it as part of your styles function, and it should also have instructions and standard text and suggested text for uh, what information should be included in each section. They're highly recommended, and I'm going to just show you right now what has been sent to you, I think, in your materials. This is an example of a clinical study report template. It's a global template. And, and some people make mistakes of thinking, uh, and I've asked my clients, do you have a template that I can follow? If not, I'll provide one. And, and on at least one occasion, I was sent sort of an outline, which was basically the headers from the, the guidance, the ICH E6 guidance, that govern, or E3 rather, that governs the CSRs. So, you know, that's great, that's helpful, but it doesn't really tell me what information they want to convey. So a good template will have all of these types of text in it. It will have instructional text. In this case, this is green and it's italicized. The reason it's italicized is because in my documents, I don't put any italics. So I know that if I see italics, it's instructional text. Um, some people like to italicize things for emphasis. I don't think that's a best practice. I think that's distracting to reviewers. So I don't put anything in here that I don't want reviewers to see. So all this instructional test, text will obviously come out before this document gets sent to any reviewers. And then there are additional types of text. There's sample or optional text, suggested text, and standard text. And as we go through the document, you're going to see these different types of text throughout. So here's our title page. You see there's a whole lot of instructional text here. Then we get through the synopsis, which we'll talk about at the end of uh, our discussion today. Then your table of contents, you can see that they're um, organized in a certain way. You can, you can have indents for each of your different level headers if you like. This one indents, some people don't like that. They like to have everything along the left margin. You can actually make your template look however you want. That's the beauty of all this automation we have in Word and the styles that we use. Um, so these, the table of contents, it's pretty big. We usually don't allow all these level four headers in here. This one like 14.3.1.1, that's a level four header because it has four numerals uh, around the decimals. Most uh, documents go down to level three. That makes the, uh, the table of contents shorter. So the basic standard way to do this is to just go to level three headers. This particular one goes out to level four. Either one is fine. It just depends on how long you want your table of contents to be. And you're going to see additional tables of contents in all of your regulatory documents. CSRs have a very long list of in-text tables and a very long list sometimes of in-text figures. This one happens to have a few, but sometimes there are a lot of figures in CSRs and depends a lot of times on the stage of development. Then you have a list of abbreviation and definitions of terms. This is, you're going to see this. We'll talk about this as well. And now we get into the body of the CSR or the text section. And you can see here we have standard text as well as instructional text. And as you go through the template, you're going to see that there's a lot of information here that's considered standard that you probably don't even have to replicate because it should be in your template. And every time you generate a clinical study report, the same text is going to be there. And that's what makes it standardized and makes it look very professional and allows the writer to focus on more important things like the actual data. So that's just a good idea. Uh, this is just an idea of a good template and, and the things that should be provided in that. So that's there for you for, uh, for your reference should you ever need it. So as I've said, in your templates, embedded into it are your header styles, your bullet list, your numbered list. All of these things are functions in Word that can be modified to your, spe your exact specifications if you choose to generate your own template. And the section titles are actually generated based on ICH E3 CSR, so I apologize for this typo. It should be E3 here. All right, let's talk now more specifically about the clinical study report. So there are some points that I think you should remember about all regulatory documents. 
All regulatory documents have sections that are used someplace else. The introduction is a good example of that. The introduction is very often carried over from protocol to protocol to protocol. It's maybe the same introduction in your investigator's brochure, and it is also usually copied into your clinical study report. You may have to update it depending on how long it's been since the study was started. If it's an early phase one study, for instance, it's, it's going to have results reported out fairly soon after the protocol was written, compared with maybe a very large phase that uh, takes years to complete. So it, it depends really on what phase of drug development you're in as to whether or not you need to update the introduction. But typically, you're going to pull it from the, from the protocol. The interesting thing about a clinical study, uh, in terms of things that are used elsewhere, the whole beginning of the clinical study report is really your protocol with the tense changed. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the front end and the back end. But uh, basically, you take the whole protocol and import it into the, into the clinical study report. So when I say uh, all documents have sections that are used elsewhere eventually, I'm really serious about it when I talk about protocols. There are a lot of similarities. Um, all reports are going to have sections that are the same. These are sort of your static sections. This is what I call the front end or the show. And then the changing information, which is more dynamic, is the back end. That's where all the data come in. And so you'll hear me talk about front end and back end, and I'm going to elucidate that a little bit more. But one thing it's really important to remember is that a report is a report is a report. It doesn't matter if you're working in devices, diagnostics, pharma, biologics. You basically have the same components. You're going to have text, you're going to have some subject narratives, and you're going to have some appendices. That's what a CSR breaks down to. So no matter where you're working or what kind of intervention you're developing, they're all, going to fo they're all going to follow this format for the clinical study report. And you can take things out or add things in as you need. So that's what's really important. So the guidance for CSRs. The guidance for CS CSRs is the ICH E3 guidance. This was developed in 1995. Uh, most of the ICH guidances came out around that time. I've provided that for you here as well. There's also, uh, sometimes there are updates. If they don't want to reissue the guidance, they would sometimes, the uh, ICH working group will often uh, send out a questions and answers or an FAQ update, things like that. Every once in a while you will see a revision. And they may be revising the uh, documents in the near future. But in the meantime, the last version I've seen of anything that's come out is 2012. So that's also provided for you. It's always a good idea, however, to check and see if something new has come up in the guidance. Uh, it never hurts to just have a double check there. So your template as we've talked about, should be based on the ICH E3 guidance. The template I've provided for you is. As a matter of fact, a lot of the green instructional text comes directly out of the guidance. So it really has uh, most of the guidance installed right inside the template itself. So you want to be really consistent and keep things as, as similar as possible. So for the ICH E3 guidance, it will list all of the requirements that have to be provided. And it gives you a numbering system. Now, you're, it's not required that you follow the numbering system, but it is recommended because most of the reviewers are used to seeing things in this order, and it just helps to facilitate the review process. Plus, in my opinion, it's actually written very well, and it makes a lot of sense. There's uh, a little glitch in there that I'll point out later that, I'm, that uh, I think probably is easily rectified and has been handled in the template that I've given to you, and we'll, we'll talk about it when I get there. So you're not required to follow the numbering system, but as I say, uh, I do recommend it. But if, whether you follow it or don't, always be consistent so that all of your CSRs are following the same uh, specific format. You can delete headings. You can add headings. Um, it's up to you. So per ICH E3, these are the requirements of the different sections or the types of information that you have to include in your CSR. Okay, now let's check number one. You get to use your feedback buttons. Style guides and templates are highly recommended. The green check for true and the red X if you think it's false. Excellent. That is true. Good job. Okay, so getting started. We're going to start with our template and our style guide. And by the way, if you don't have a style guide and you don't really have the resources to generate one, the AMA manual style is a really good reference. Uh, it's the industry standard. The last edition, I think, is the 10th, although the 11th may be coming out if it hasn't already. I'm not 100% sure about that. But it's not an expensive book, and it's a really great resource. So if you don't have a style guide, I would recommend using that. Also use good examples. If you have in-house studies that were con conducted previously that you can follow, 
that's always a great resource, especially if you don't have a template. And other published studies may give you ideas of uh, information or things that you need to include. So you can often find CSRs floating around on the web. It's surprising how much is out there. Uh, I always recommend to use a checklist. My checklist has at the top and the bottom in bold to make sure that I update the table of contents. I have been known in the past to send out documents for signature where I had forgotten to update the table of contents. So you only make that mistake once. I can tell you that right now. So generate a checklist as you start working and writing these documents, and that will help you to make sure that you don't miss anything. And if there are things you find that you sort of do as a habit that are not a good habit, that's where you want to highlight it in bold to make sure that you don't miss that. If there are lessons learned during the study or during the program for this intervention, use them. Help, have them be implemented in some way in your CSR, especially if it has to do with the writing or any of the key messages uh, that are being imparted in your document. You, you will absolutely need the protocol, obviously, and you need the data. But you don't always need the data to get started. You can finish the whole front end, which is basically your protocol, uh, without having your data. This is called the shell. This is normally what we call a shell, where the front end is finished, and maybe you have some representative tables uh, in the back end. You know, we'll give an, uh, a, an initial review or an idea of what to expect and what's coming. We don't always have the luxury of preparing a shell, but if you have the time, it's really helpful. So when we get started, we have all of these things that we talked about, and we're going to start looking at the CSR and what are we going to populate in here. So as I've said, we have, we have basically two sections. We have the front end and the back end. The front end is basically what did we plan to do. It's the whole plan. This is basically almost exclusively from the protocol. There are some pieces that aren't, but for the most part, it's your protocol. What you do is basically, in, an, in essence, is you take your protocol and you copy and paste it and change the tense. That's, that's the sort of the broad view of it. However, the guidance suggests that we clarify study details that are not well described. And I will say that there is a lot of discussion in the medical writing community about this. There are two uh, sort of thoughts uh, or schools of thought about what to do with this. There are some writers who are purists and say, I didn't write the protocol, it's not my job to fix it or make any clarifications, my job is to copy and paste it and stick it in the document the way that it was. But for me, I'm not in, in that school of thought. The guidance says that we're supposed to clarify it. And for me, I want to put out the best document that I can. If I'm not clear about something that was written in the protocol, if it's not clear to me, perhaps it's not clear to some other reviewers as well. So. Maybe it should be clarified. Uh, and because the guidance suggests it, I think that's best practice. So that's what I teach. So if things aren't clear in the protocol, and this happens, a lot of protocols were written years before you even start the CSR. You don't know what was going on in people's heads. Also, there may have been a lot of amendments. I have written CSRs for protocols that have been amended nine times. So you're going to sometimes get a lot of confusion in those situations, or maybe things were missed or overlooked or just inconsistent in which case it's our job to prevent a clear picture of what was planned. So my recommendation is to always clarify study details that weren't well described in the protocol into your CSR. So that's the front end. The back end is what did we do, okay? What are the results? What are the data? Also, I want to talk about the appendices, and I always talk about this up front, and people say, why are you worrying about this now? Well, I consider it part of the front end. Because as the study is ongoing, all of the information for the appendices theoretically have been collected. But that isn't always the case. So you need to identify up front who is collecting all of this information for the appendices. Who's QCing it? Who's making sure everything is there that is supposed to be? It's a very lengthy process. Uh, the appendices are a lot of hard work. And if it hasn't been monitored over time, then you're, you could be in deep trouble. I'm working on a submission now where the appendices, nobody monitored, it, monitored what the CRO was collecting, and some things fell through the cracks, which is going to happen, right? So uh, we're scrambling now to get all of this information and have the CRO go collect the information so that we can submit in time. This, uh, this could actually hold up a submission for registration for your entire uh, product that you've spent years developing. So it's really important when you start a CSR to make sure you know what has to go into the appendices, who is, re who is responsible for collecting them, collating them, QCing them, etc. Because you also, once the appendices are done, you have to make sure that what's in the appendices actually matches what's in the text. Some of those things are directly related. So you can't finalize the CSR body until the appendices are there and everything's cross-checked. 
So it's very important to plan up front for those. All right, so let's talk about the front end or the shell. It's basically comprised of these things in blue, your references, and it may or may not include your synopsis, which is why it's not in blue, but we can talk about that when we talk about the synopsis. So if you have time, it's a huge advantage to be able to prepare the shell or the front end uh, in advance. Basically, it's the text from the protocol with the tense change and some of the organizational pieces like your table of contents, uh, your list of abbreviations and definitions of terms, and as I said before, it could also contain some unpopulated tables. Uh, signature pages are something you need to think about as well. Revision history, which is not as important in a CSR, but some of the templates have it. So let's talk about your title page. This typically is going to come right from your protocol, and usually it's a protocol title. And the guidance says a brief description if the title is unclear. So your title really should be a snapshot of your whole study. Some people like to title things with acronyms. And if it's not clear everything that's going on in the study, like the phase, how many centers, et cetera, then you want to clarify uh, here in, in your title page. Whatever your protocol number is, the indication, the study phase, all of these things are pretty much going to come from your protocol cover page. Here's an example of a confidentiality statement. Typically, your legal department wants to tell you what to write, and this should be part of your template anyway, but it's just there in case uh, you're not familiar with it. Revision history. Typically, it goes right behind the cover page. This is not required by ICHE3, although some companies do it. Most CSRs are not amended in a way that perhaps uh, you're familiar with seeing with protocols. Typically, a CSR once done is final, and it's very rare to see, uh, have any kind of revisions. But it does happen on rare occasion. My feeling is I wouldn't put a revision history page in unless we were absolutely revising it. But some people like to put the revision history page in, say that it's the original CSR and put the date. It's up to you how you want to do that. Again, with everything else in regulatory writing, to just be consistent. Table of contents, we've talked about the table and tables of contents when we went through the template a little bit. These are typically automated. If your template is organized with table, fig table captions, your headings are appropriately formatted within Word, and it's very easy to do this. If you're not familiar with it, somebody can teach you. Uh, you can even probably get a tutorial on YouTube. Or, uh, but it's very simple. We typically go out to level three headers, and if all your styles and table and figure captions, et cetera, are formatted, you can just hit a button and your table of contents will be generated for you and then updated as you go. And these are the, the tables of contents that we talked about previously. Signature page. If you have a wet signature page still, then you need to make sure that it's in your template, that there are enough spaces for each signatory. This is usually, uh, this is actually in the, in the back. It's one of the appendices, and it's usually the last appendix because obviously you don't sign off until it's finished. Uh, and the, the types of signatories often depend on the type of studies. For instance, if you're doing a PK study in phase one, then you might have a clinical pharmacologist be one of the signatories. You might not have that in phase three. You might not be doing any uh, related data. All that stuff might be done early in development. So it really depends on the phase of development, what, you know, who signs off. Do you need a PI signature? If you're doing global studies, absolutely you need this. In the U.S., it's not required. Okay, list of abbreviations and definitions of terms. The first thing you need to know about abbreviations is there are rules about it. And what you'll find <laughs> with medical writing everywhere is there are rules pretty much about everything, even as to how many spaces between one sentence and the next. So, uh, and I can tell you I spent two hours in a meeting about that. That's how crazy medical writers can be sometimes. Uh, the rules are basic. These are basic. Uh, your AMA manual style or your own style guide should uh, give you exactly what you need to know about them. But we have a concept called first use, and that is when you first use the abbreviation, you spell it out, and then you put the abbreviation in parentheses. After that, you use it, you just use the abbreviation, unless it's at the beginning of a sentence, or unless your style guide says you can abbreviate at the beginning of a sentence, because it really depends on what your style guide says. AMA manual style says not to. For the synopsis in the body, first you apply in both places. The synopsis is considered a standalone document. I'm not even sure it's actually required in ICHE3, uh, but it is required to have one by most regulators. So uh, you do first use both, both in the synopsis and the body of the CSR. ICHE3 says you only have to spell out unusual terms, so you can choose how you do this. You can choose what the exceptions are. For instance, when I was working on a diagnostic kit for uh, a gene-based diagnostic, 
uh, application, I spelled out deoxyribonucleic acid and put it in parentheses, and the client came back and said, you don't need to, to explain what DNA is. Everybody you know, in genomics knows what DNA is. So there you go. That's an exception to first use. So really kind of understand your therapeutic area and how people are going to feel about that and have a standard and stick to it no matter what you do. If there's any takeaway from this, consistency is the takeaway that I want you to remember. And your style guide should always define how you are going to handle abbreviations. Typically, this stuff is formatted already in your template, and you will almost always have a pre-populated list of abbreviations. So you're going to have to go through there, take things out that don't apply to the particular CSR that you're writing, and add in the abbreviations and their definitions for things that aren't in that pre-populated list. And be careful about capitalization. There's a lot of overcapitalization in medical writing. Again, think about that and stick with what's in your style guide. So here is an example of a list of abbreviations and definitions of terms. Sometimes you see grid lines. This is actually in a table format. You can't tell here because the grid lines have been removed. You, sometimes you see the grid lines and sometimes you don't. It's a style thing. You can see that we have capitalized proper nouns and not capitalized things that are not proper nouns. Here's an example, though, of overcapitalization. Now, some people for the list of abbreviations want the first letter capitalized everywhere. So you have to pick one of these processes, and however you do it, again, be consistent. There's no one way that's perfect. It's really fine to do it any way that you choose. It's just a matter of being consistent among your documents. So the ethics section is part of your front end. It should be part of your template, okay? This is section five if you're following ICHE3. This is, has everything to do with your ethical conduct of the study. So there should be some statement regarding IRB. It's some standard text, hopefully, in your template that confirms that the study and all amendments were reviewed by an IRB or an IEC if it's a global study. Then the next subheader, 5.2, has some statements regarding ethical conduct of the study. So there's some standard text confirming the study was conducted in accordance with applicable guidances, uh, good clinical practice, or any other good practices that you are adhering to in the study should be here. Uh, the guidance actually talks about putting this on the cover page. Uh, now that we have this streamlined ethics section, it makes more sense to put it here. So most people have taken it off the cover page and put it here, which also helps to keep the cover page onto one page, which is really what you want. And then section 5.3 has to do with informed consent. So a little bit more drilling down for IRBs in section 5.1. Per your good clinical practices, studies with human subjects should be rev reviewed and approved by an IRB. So you want to make sure that your text it talks about uh, open, that you're being open about the fact that this is actually research that was conducted. You want to confirm that the protocol and any amendments were reviewed appropriately by the appropriate authorities, primarily IRBs or IECs. And you're always going to refer to where the information can be found in the appendices. So for IRBs and IECs, there's going to be some text in this section that says, you know, refer to Appendix 16.1.3, or there will be some line that says a list of IRBs and IECs used in the study can be found or are provided in Appendix 16.1.3. And this section, this Appendix 16.1.3, gets cross-referenced in blue text. You actually insert a cross-reference in blue text into your documents. Oh, actually, for appendices, you can't insert one because it's going to be a separate granular piece. Um, you would do that for tables and figures. But you would highlight this so that uh, whoever's publishing this knows that it should be linked. Informed consent, this is section 5.3. You're going to make sure that there's text that describes how and, how and when informed consent was maintained. You want to specify that it was written. Uh, if there are any uh, kind of provisions for verbal, then that needs to be described here as well. Were there any translations? How many languages, how many countries are you conducting your study in? If you're conducting in a number of different uh, countries, you may have had to translate your ICF, in which case that needs to be explained here and described. And again, you'll talk about re representative informed consent form and patient information. You'll refer to the appropriate appendix and cross-reference it in blue text. The next section, investigators and study administrative structure. This is section six per ICH. Now, this is typically done in a table. This is where you talk about all the people, the key people who were involved in administering the study, the PI, the PI site. Uh, was there a steering committee? 
Were there CROs involved? What about clinical laboratory facilities, reference laboratories, your IRBs? Uh, ideally, there's a central IRB and you only have to list one, otherwise you would refer them to the appropriate appendix because you're not going to put all the IRBs here. Clinical supplies management. So all of these things go into sort of a table primarily in Section 6. The template that I give you I think writes it out. It doesn't have a table format in there if I'm not mistaken, but I think a table format is more appropriate. So aside from the table, you're going to have this appendix that includes a list of your investigators and affiliations. It's going to have CVs of at least the PIs and the sub-I's, uh, medical licenses, and there will be a similar list for other persons that affect study conduct. So uh, this appendix is going to have a lot of information. So you, may, you want, definitely want to make sure that you refer people to that. As reviewers are going through this, and when I talk about reviewers, I'm primarily talking now about regulatory reviewers. They want to be able to link to that and see it um, if, if they have questions or uh, some curiosity about it. So again, we're going to, for uh, this appendix 16.1.4, you're going to refer to it in the temp, hopefully it's in your template. You're going to cross-reference in blue text. You have a list of all your investigative sites, their affiliations, the role in the study, and their qualifications. Okay, now let's check number two. Starting the shell early gives no advantage. The green check if you think it's true and press the red X for false. Good job, that is false. It's really great when you have an opportunity to do that. It doesn't happen as often as we'd like, I think. Okay, the introduction. Typically, as I said, this is taken from the protocol. It's often used in all protocols for that compound or even sometimes for that indication with just minor modifications for the compound. It should really be about one to two pages. You can subdivide at your discretion. There are some standard sort of subcategories that are used, like background, risk and benefits, rationale for dose, things like that. Uh, and the introduction always needs to be supported by appropriate references from the published literature. You don't necessarily always have to submit this, but it does have to be available if the reviewers ask for them. So this is section seven per ICH E3. So in the background, and this should hopefully again come from either your protocol or your investigator's brochure, it should describe the following things. A brief description of the intended disease or therapeutic area under investigation, information on prevalence and cost of treatment, current standard of care for the target disease. This is usually other compounds that are currently being used, but you can also talk about other compounds that are in development in this class, especially if it's a, you know, a certain drug class or a certain biologic class. You talk about gaps in existing knowledge and how they were supposedly addressed in the study. And if there weren't gaps in knowledge, there should be something in that introduction that explains why what you're developing adds value to the community. Also, regulatory statements go here. Um, guidelines followed in protocol development other than those that are in the ethics section. So on occasion, there are specific guidances that are described maybe for pediatrics, uh, pediatric population or something like that. You would talk about having followed those guidances here. And any other relevant agreements or meetings with regulatory authorities where something was described and was followed up on in the conduct of the study should be addressed here as well. Risks and benefits, this should come from your protocol. Ideally, that should be noted in the protocol. We started putting risk and benefits into the protocols relatively recently in pharma. I think that Europe and the device community are kind of ahead of us here in the U.S. for this kind of information, but it's becoming very clear that regulatory authorities want to see this not just overseas but here in the U.S., so we've really started adding this. If your protocol doesn't have these or your template doesn't have these, it's important to add it. But basically, it's a summary of the known and potential risks and benefits to human subjects for whatever intervention you're developing. Now, your investigational plan section, this is very detailed, and the ICH guidance is very detailed. You can complete most of this in your shell. Uh, depending on how your template is organized, you can either complete all of it. If not all of it, then most. So the investigational plan section looks something like this. Overall study design and plan, your discussion of your study design, including your choice of control groups, the selection of your study population, your treatments, your study assessments, data quality assurance, your statistical methods, and any changes in the conduct of the study or planned analyses. So let's talk about section 9.1 first. So hopefully your protocol and CSR templates match 
Uh, if your protocol template and your CSR templates were developed together, they probably do. If your protocol was written a really long time ago, it's very possible that they don't. But you want to basically just take it from the protocol. And sometimes you have to search around in the protocol if they're not sort of matched together. Uh, but you should be able to find things, hopefully, in the protocol that, that uh, fits in here. You always want to check things for accuracy. And, <clears throat> and you identify sources if it's a source other than the protocol. So if you add information into this section that doesn't come from the protocol, you want to make sure that you make that clear. You want to include information about the plan, what type of study design did you use, was it parallel crossover, was it blinded? Include your flow chart if you had one. If you don't have one, you might want to develop one. What your population was and the number of subjects that were planned. Uh, the method of, of assigning treatments. The sequence and duration of study periods. Now in section 9.2, we're going to talk about the study design and why we chose what we did. Now ideally this should come from a section in your uh, clinical protocol as well, either from the intro or from the section 9 in the protocol, or if, uh, hopefully you're going to have some discussion internally. You're going to talk about what specific controls were used, why they were chosen, why did you choose the study design, why crossover versus parallel design for instance, and what are the known or potential problems with this particular design, and how did you handle those problems. You want to pay particular attention to things like historical controls. Those need to be described very clearly. Uh, presence or absence of washout periods and why this was or was not done. And your rationale for your dose and your dose interval selection. This again should come from a well-designed introduction. So hopefully it's in your protocol as well. Section 9.3, we talk about the selection of the study population, okay? This is primarily your eligibility criteria. This should come directly from your protocol. And again, you're going to just change the tense. Uh, you should always just have a lead-in sentence. This should come from your protocol as well. And then you add in all your inclusion criteria, change the tense. If you write the protocol in a, in a thoughtful process about how it can be translated into the CSR, you'll find that it's really easy to change the tense for this. It takes a little time because you're changing just pretty much every number you know, each, each inclusion and exclusion criterion. But sometimes it's a little faster depending on how they're written in the protocol. And you also include in here removal of subjects from therapy or assessment. What were the predetermined reasons for removal? What type of follow-up occurred? Were subjects replaced? If not, you know, what was the plan in the protocol? And remember, we're talking here about what was planned. So we're not going to actually talk in here about where su were subjects actually replaced. We're just saying that they could be replaced or the plan was to replace them. You don't list in this section, you know, which subjects were removed and which, which subjects replaced them. So just don't get confused there. I find that in section 9.3, that's where you, the most confusion occurs, where people start to put results or information here in the section, and we don't do that here at all. We're just doing, this is basically what we plan to do. We're telling the reviewers this was the plan, when you get to section 10, we're going to start telling you what really happened. Now the treatment section, section 9.4. I want to just speak really briefly about this section. If you're developing, say, a combination product, this may be split into two sections, right? It might be split into uh, your drug or biologic, and the next part of the section would be about your device. If you're in a device company and you're not working with any kind of drug, you would change this to be about your device, and you might change some of these subheaders to actually fit what makes sense for your device. So keep that in mind. As I'm talking about this, if you're working in any of these other areas, this can just be modified to fit exactly what your needs are. So this is the uh, breakdown per ICH E3 for Section 9.4. Your treatments administered, the identity of those investigational products, how subjects were assigned to the treatment groups, the selection of the doses, and selection and timing of dose for each subject, blinding, prior concomitant therapy, and treatment compliance. So 9.4.1, you really want to be precise about the treatments that were administered. You need to be very clear about what was administered in each arm for each period, what was the route and mode of administration, what was the dose and the dosage schedule. There's all kinds of information here uh, that has to be very clear about who got what. Now to, we want to talk about the identity of the investigational products. This is also, it can get pretty intense here depending on how many 
products you're using. If you've got a placebo and a comparator and one or two different types of drugs or even different dose regimens, this gets pretty, this can get pretty hefty. So you have to decide whether you want to use a table, text, or mixture. So rule of thumb for tables. If there is a lot of data, regardless of whether it's just numbers, it should go into a table. So you'll very often find a table here that lists the drug, the information about the formulation, the, uh, who manufactured it, things like that. So it's very important to make sure that it's easily readable and understandable. If you're finding you're doing paragraphs and paragraphs of text describing this, think about whether it should go in a table or not. But this is the kind of information that should go in here. If there's more than one batch, you refer them to Appendix 16.1.6 where you list the batch numbers. You have to talk about sources. If there was any modifications in the compounds once it went to the site, was it compounded there? What happened? Uh, is there resupply? Specific storage requirements goes in the section as well. And for use past expiry date, what I want you to note is that we have to ID subjects receiving them or if there were protocol deviations. So you're going to refer people to this particular section in Section 10 or later in Section 9, which we'll get to when we talk about protocol deviations. Investigational treatments, method of assigning subjects to treatment groups, Section 9.4.3. Again, this is more information. This should be in the protocol, but it might come out of your statistical analysis plan, how subjects were assigned to the treatment groups. This is really how they were randomized, if a randomization was occurred. If there was no randomization, they were just entered chronologically. This sometimes happens for open label studies where everybody knows who's getting what. So this is where you describe this. You want to specify the allocation methods. Was it a centralized IVRS or IWRS? where their allocation with site, within the sites. Was it an adaptive randomization? What happened there? Did, you know, did they go into a bunch of different treatment arms and then eventually get funneled into one? What, what was the stratification? What were the block sizes for randomization? All this information goes into this section. A detailed description of the randomization is in Appendix 16.1.7. This should be supplied to you typically by your statistician. And again, anytime you do refer to something, you refer, it, hopefully it's in the template and you cross-reference it in blue text. Those appendix numbers, by the way, don't change. They're standard. So if it, it should be in your template because you don't have to revise them for each CSR. They're exactly the same each time. All right, treatments, selection of doses in the study, 9.4.4. Here's where we're going to talk about the doses or dose ranges that were used for all study drugs, including placebo and the basis for the choice. This can often be phase dependent. You know, in phase one, the selection of doses is almost exclusively generated based on the non-clinical data, and that information will come, if not from your protocol, then from your investigator's brochure. By the time you get to phase three, you're relying really specifically on prior human experience. Phase one and two, the whole goal, well, not the whole goal, but a big part of the goal is to determine your phase three dose. Your phase three dose really should be the dose and the, the formulation, everything should be decided based on what you think is going to happen for what you, what you plan to market. So by phase three, you should know what your marketed dose is, what your marketed regimen is, et cetera. That's the whole point of phase three is determining if that makes sense. And in phase four, it's typically commercial products, so it's based on the label recommendations. Now, selection and timing of these doses for each subject, this is what we put into section 9.4.5. And again, all this really is coming from the protocol, so I want you to keep remembering that. Uh, here you're going to describe the process for the assign, assigning of compounds and controls, et cetera. So how did it happen? Was it a simple randomization? Were there particular selected regimens? Was there a titration? Uh, what happened with the dose for each subject or each treatment arm so that you can explain, now that we've figured out what the dose is, why each treatment arm got these doses? Was there anything that was specific in terms of timing or intervals? Was there something, was it relative to meals? Was dosing uh, started or ended at a certain time point for a specific reason? And also instructions for how the doses were given. Who administered it? How were, was it recorded? How was it confirmed? Now blinding or masking. If you do ophthalmics, we use the term masking, not blinding for obvious reasons. Um, this is section 9.4.6. This should also be well described in your protocol. This is really, uh, there should probably be a lot of standard text actually, both in your protocol and in your CSR here. But you do want to talk about how the blinding was maintained. 
uh, labeling comes in here, you know, how the labeling, uh, the blind was maintained in the labeling, what type of blind was done. And if it was a single blind study, for instance, where maybe you have a rater that was blinded only or some other person was blinded or some portions of the, of the group were blinded or you had a data monitoring committee that may or may not have been blinded, how do you shield uh, the people that are working on this study? How was that done so that the blind wasn't broken? All this information needs to be communicated very clearly in the CSR. Was there an interim analysis? How was the blind maintained for that, if it was? What happened around the blind for the interim analysis? So all of these things, uh, how are things matched in, for, your, for your compound? If you have a placebo, how did you match it or a comparator? How did, how did you keep subjects from knowing what one, that they were getting something different from someone else? And procedures for break, breaking the blind, what were they? Prior and concomitant therapies, section 9.4.7. What was allowed and what was not? It should be in the protocol a definition of what, what constitute prior med and what constitutes concomitant meds. The reason for this is there may be different interpretations. Your company may decide that once the informed consent is signed, those, those subjects are on study, so anything up to that point is a prior med, anything after that is a concomitant med. But in some cases, companies feel that you're not considered on study until a dose of study drug was administered, or maybe the first study procedure occurred, a screening procedure, for instance. They may, maybe they signed informed consent and screening procedures didn't start for another month. So find out what exactly the definition is and make sure that you're clear on that. Because all your data are going to come and they should have that same philosophy. If there's a difference in what the data show versus what you understand is, you know, the definition, then you really need to talk with your team about that. So we need to talk about prior and concom meds, what was allowed, what wasn't allowed, how they were recorded, uh, any other specific rules or procedures around this. And I find that a table format is often helpful for this. It really depends on how many uh, drugs you're actually talking about that are allowed, et cetera. Treatment compliance, 9.4.8. This is a common trap here as well. Noncompliance is not discussed here. We don't talk about who was not compliant. What we talk about here only is the method. What measures were taken to ensure and document compliance? So drug accountability, were there diary cards, drug concentration measurements, all those kinds of things. Now here's where I deviate a little bit from uh, ICHE3. Basically, the, this header, 9.5, is efficacy and safety variables. But the guidance only really talks about the flow chart appropriate measurements, and then primary efficacy variables. It doesn't ask you to really talk about your safety variables. So a lot of people actually add safety variables in here because they think uh, just as important. So if you're going to call it efficacy and safety, um, and I just call it efficacy and safety. I don't even talk about the variables because we're talking also about assessments in here. We're not just talking about uh, the outputs or the variables. So I add uh, safety in here. I think that's just one kind of weird inconsistency in the ICH E3 guidance. So the first thing, efficacy and safety measurements assessed in the flow charts. So here we're talking about the assessments, 9.5.1. That's why, again, why I just say efficacy and safety and I change it from variables because I think variables is too specific for this. So it's about assessments. So assessments is basically what you did. Variables are the outputs there. And here we're talking about primarily what we did, not really when we did it. The flow chart is going to describe that. Hopefully your schedule of assessments is uh, very well done. The assessments are basically your tools, your method, something, some action that was taken uh, to complete a measurement. All right. So when we talk about assessments, we're talking about things like procedures that were done, ECGs, quality of life, clinical laboratory tests, things of that nature. The variables are really the outcomes. So we're talking about all the assessments here. We're not just talking about the outcomes. All the assessments that were done must be described in the CSR. Hopefully they're well described in the protocol. Ideally, if you write a good protocol, you have a schedule of assessments, and every assessment that is in that schedule of assessments, which is that big table in the middle of your, of your document, will have a section in the assessment section in the protocol that describes the method. So I think about that section, the assessment section, as sort of like a methods section in a publication, okay? I really see it you know, describing the methodology of what was done. If that's done in your protocol, you're in really good shape because you can just really take that out. I recommend breaking it down into subsections. I break it down here into screening and baseline, safety, 
and efficacy, or you can do efficacy first and then safety. I think the guidance does efficacy first, actually. However you do it, be consistent. So it should be consistent with the order that's in your protocol, and it should be consistent in all of your documents. So your template should be formatted appropriately. If you have any PK or PD assessments, you add this section. If you don't, you don't add this section. It's that simple. And or some people put not applicable. They like to really stick to ICH. It's really up to you how you do that. And then at the end is your schedule of assessments. So again, you're going to improve protocol text if need, uh, who completed each of these assessments, how were they done, etc. If there are any unused sections in your protocol, you need to think about whether it goes in here or not. So screening and baseline measurements. This is subsection 9.5.1.1. Describe only those assessments done once in this section. So you might have a physical exam at screening, but you also may have it later on in the study. So if it's, if it's done not just exclusively for eligibility, then we don't put it here. This is typically before you administer your study drug or your intervention or whatever is, is actually happening. So this is basically any assessments that are done for eligibility are defined here. The next two sections for safety and efficacy, you're just going to take the descriptions from the protocol like you did for anything else, and you're going to add subsections for those assessments. One thing it's important to point out is all CSRs have safety because all protocols have safety. Even if you're doing an abbreviated CSR, let's say a study was terminated because uh, there was a lack of efficacy, and you may not have any efficacy data to report, or there may not even be enough subjects, you still have to report the safety. So you're always going to have safety in this document. In the assessment section is where we put the definitions of adverse events, serious adverse events, causality, and relationship. Now 9.5.1.4, if you have PK and PD assessments, then you use this. You can further subdivide. You will find that you see this obviously a lot in phase one where a lot of the pharmacokinetic studies are done. You may, it may even be a pharmacokinetic study. You might not even have an efficacy section. You might not, it might be too early to look at efficacy, but you might have pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics. If you want to divide it into bigger subsections, if you want to do a PK section and a PD section, you can. It's really up to you. Other assessments, uh, were there exploratory or subset analyses? You can add a subsection for that as well. Section 9.5.1.5 is your schedule of assessments. You basically copy this from the protocol, but you want to make sure that the table format is consistent with your style guide. I find that people like to take a lot of liberties with tables and add a lot of stuff we don't need, like shading and uh, types of grid lines and things like that. None of that's really needed. Uh, and it's very distracting to reviewers. For me, I keep my tables just standard grid lines, uh, either quarter point or half point, and just grid lines around the whole. You know, every grid line is there. I don't take them out. If a reviewer has to get a ruler out and hold it up to their screen or hold it onto a piece of paper if they printed something out, then we're not doing our job, in my opinion. I think we need to make it easy for them to read the data. And in a CSR, there are some really, really big tables, like huge tables. Some are like five and six pages long. So if you start to remove grid lines, you really make it a lot harder for people to follow. So we want to make sure that, that the table format is well done, that clarity is there, uh, that there's consistency with the text. Even if it wasn't consistent in the protocol, in the CSR, we want to make sure everything in the schedule of assessments has, a, has an assessment listed. Uh, all of that information is clear. So if I look at the assessment section and see something, I should be able to go to the schedule of assessments and see it there and vice versa. Make sure that you put sources on your tables. I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, abbreviations, footnotes, all of those things have to be included. And what the schedule of assessments gives you more than just a snapshot of what happened in the study is it gives you timing. You don't really have to talk about timing anywhere else. You don't talk about it in the assessment section. That's methods. Remember, it's just methods. It's how we did something. It's not about what visits we did it at, anything like that. The timing is very clearly shown in your schedule of assessments, and it's the most appropriate place to put it. It's going to look something like this. Okay, all of these procedures, every one of these procedures should have something somewhere listing what happens and how it's done in your protocol. And you're going to see uh, all the timing here over the visits, et cetera. This is what the footnotes look like. Footnotes for scheduled assessments can be huge. They can be more than a page. The first thing you do is you put all your abbreviations down. Um, some people like to 
put the word abbreviations here. I think it's self-explanatory. So if it's self-explanatory, I really don't feel a need to explain it. I think we're doing enough explanation in a CSR or any regulatory document. So if it's not necessary, I don't add it. After your abbreviations come your footnotes. Footnotes are always done with letters. Now, I know you're going to see them differently, but uh, I can tell you that the standard is to do them with, uh, with letters, and if we get to too many, then we start doing double, like AABB, et cetera. The reason is none of these are really typically confused with mathematical functions. So if we use asterisks and things like that, it starts to get confusing. Uh, and then you have to start going to a bunch of different symbols anyway, because if you start using too many asterisks, you know, how do you keep track of what's five asterisks versus six asterisks? And so then people go to other symbols and it becomes, I think, very confusing. So we tend to stick as a standard to this type of footnoting in all regulatory documents. So I recommend that you stick with that plan as well. Okay. 9.5.2, appropriateness of measurements. So this should come from your protocol or maybe from your statistical analysis plan. You really want to talk about how, why your measurements were reliable, accurate, and, and have relevance to the data that are being generated. This really encompasses all of your assessments. You also want to describe alternative things, uh, assessments or measurements that were considered but rejected and why. And if you are just using surrogate endpoints, and these basically are not direct measures of clinical benefit, it's often like looking at antigen expression or something of that nature. We often see this more frequently uh, in phase one, but I will say with biologics, we often see a lot of biomarker uh, information being generated. So you want to justify it. Why, you know, why, was, why were you looking at this surrogate marker and what relevance does it have? Primary efficacy variables and drug concentration methods. Um, if you're not, um, two brackets is the standard abbreviation for concentration, so I have used it here. Uh, so we have two sections here, 9.5.3 and 9.5. Uh, very oftentimes we describe this in other subsections. So things that are widely understood, you want to make sure that they're covered in the appropriate place. So think about when you're talking about primary efficacy variables, drug concentration measurements, et cetera, what goes here and what goes on. Primary efficacy variables we definitely talk about in the statistical section. So I often don't include this here. Same with drug concentration measurements. It very often um, goes into uh, very well into the um, PKPD section, so you may or may not want to include this here. And this stuff should already be in your schedule of assessment, so it's, you, should, you should know if you've got these or not. You can also add additional subsections. If it's in the protocol, it should be in your CSR. And what I find is these sections here are very often not included in the CSR template, but they are more and more commonly being included in your protocol. So your template should be updated for this if it doesn't include this. And all of this information should be included if you use it. Um, things like confirmation of medical care by another physician is something you find a lot in global protocols. We don't see it so much here in the U.S., but reporting of SAEs, there should be a section in the CSR for this. It should be very clear how serious adverse events were reported. Uh, there should be some information about what constitutes study completion and what constitutes discontinuation of the study, and the same thing for subjects. Some people misunderstand what a completed subject is. A completed subject is not necessarily always someone who has followed every step of the protocol. A subject can be considered completed even if they didn't finish the study. That should be defined in the protocol, and it should also be defined here in the CSR. All right, data quality assurance, section 9.6. You want to make sure that you're clear about how the data were collected. Are you using paper CRFs? Are you using some other type of data collection tool? So much is automated now. So you have to be really clear about how the data were collected, how it was verified and validated. What happened to data being transferred electronically? How was that process uh, occurring? Who retains the data and for how long? Where is it retained? Uh, is there some you know, specific duration, et cetera? You might have a data management plan, in which case you can refer to that or append it to your protocol, uh, I'm sorry, to your CSR. But you still have to describe in at least brief detail some of this information in your CSR. You want to use, uh, talk about steps used to ensure use of standard terminology. We often refer to the MEDRA dictionary for AEs. There are different uh, things for drugs like the WHO drug or ATI, things like that. And you talk here also about audit procedures, and you're going to refer the reader to Appendix 16.1.8 where your audit certificates go. Okay, knowledge check number three. Adding subsections to the CSR template is helpful for flow. 
Green check for true and the red X for false. Excellent. Yes, that is true. Flow is really important. So as some of those sections that I talked about adding, it's, it's going to be very helpful. Okay, statistical methods plan in the protocol. The statistician typically provides this piece, and it mostly comes from your, the statistical analysis plan. So you may, you usually when you get the CSR, you're going to have a copy of the SAP, and uh, you can pull a lot of this stuff directly from it, but your statistician should always review it. So there are uh, two sections or subsections here, 9.7 and 9.8. Uh, we talk about statistical and analytical plans and determination of sample size in 9.7. And in 9.8, we talk about changes in the conduct of the study or planned analyses. And this is where 9.8 where it was where your front end may sort of merge with your back end, and we'll talk about that. Uh, very so we're going to talk about statistical methods, plan in the protocol, and our statistical and analytical plans. Here we are describing the planned analyses and any changes made before the results were known. We're going to talk about our data sets. Did we have an intent to treat population? Was it a mode? What kind of reference methods were uh, involved? How do we handle missing data? All of this gets described here. Determination of sample size. You're going to talk about the planned sample size. How was it calculated? All of that like, kind of really crazy math stuff that most of us don't understand goes in here. Derivations or a reference, et cetera. Describe the estimates that were used and how they were obtained. So all this really comes from your statistical analysis plan. Some of it will still be in the protocol as well. So in the guidance, basically ICH does not break this out into subsections. It just says put your stuff in here. Put your, put your statistical and analytical plan information here. I think it's more important to sort of break it down a little more. You want to really make your own and make it work. And then you go to section 972, determination of sample size. That's a little more clearly defined. So remember we talked about 953 efficacy variables. Typically, it really should go here. Because we're talking here about things that were planned in the protocol, determination of sample size, those endpoints really, in my opinion, go here. Now, you don't have to do, my, do it my way, but I just think it makes the document flow more. Some people like to see it earlier because they like to really understand what the endpoints are, but we're not really going to look at those endpoints until we get to Section 10. So I think it should go here where we describe each variable your endpoint outcome, primary, secondary, exploratory. I often break it out into efficacy, safety, PK, PKPD. Um, efficacy usually comes first because it's your, that's usually what we're looking at. But again, it could depend on the phase. Phase one, PK might be your primary endpoint. Uh, it might be a pure safety study. So generally, I break them down into this type of a format. General considerations, study populations, subject disposition, demographic and baseline data, prior concomitant treatment, your efficacy analysis, your safety analysis. A lot goes determination of sample size and definition of analysis sets 9.7.1.2. This should come out of your protocol or SAP. You really want to talk about each one of your analysis sets or you call these analysis sets or analysis populations. What types of analysis sets were you using and what and how they're defined? your ITT, your per protocol, randomized, safety, pharmacokinetics, et cetera. Uh, so this, to me, you define your analysis sets, then you define your endpoints. It, makes, it just makes more logical sense. So now we've talked about our endpoints. We've defined the analysis populations. Now we talk about the planned analyses. We move from here to what are the study logistics, disposition, demographics, et cetera. We talk about safety analyses, efficacy analyses. It just makes more logical flow, in my opinion. So here we go into sections 97.1.3 to 97.1.5, which is subject disposition, demographics and baseline data, and prior concomitant treatment. Here basically you're going to summarize the, met the methods that were used for summarizing the data, the analysis sets that were used, uh, analysis for the data, or that were planned to be used, and how the data are going to be presented. So we just really talk about here about uh, how, you know, what kind of statistics we use to summarize the data. We're going to be, tables will be provided, maybe it's listings will be provided. These are the kinds of things that we talk about here. And it usually comes from your protocol, your SAP, and your statistician. Now, in the next few sections, we're going to keep the same order as the assessment. So if your safety came first, you put it first. If e efficacy came first, you put it next. And here, we're going to talk about the types of calculations of variables or algorithms that were used for the endpoints what analysis sets were used, what hypotheses are tested, what treatment effects are estimated, 
what statistical model was used. If you're not a statistician, don't worry. All this information is going to be provided to you in your statistical analysis plan. You want to make sure that the primary analyses are, point, are, you know, are called out, that it's very specific. So you'll usually have a subsection, for instance, primary efficacy endpoint or primary efficacy analysis. Uh, the next subsection would be your secondaries. You're going to, again, you're going to describe how the data are going to be presented or provided, tables, listings, figures. How are, we, how are we going to expect to see these data? And you may need to drill down into additional levels. As I said you know, before, adding additional subsections always helps with flow. For safety, we want to talk about extent of exposure, adverse events, physical examinations. There may be additional things that we're talking about depending on what kinds of safety measures we're using, clinical laboratory evaluations, things of that, that nature. Efficacy, we are going to talk about the primary efficacy variable, secondary efficacy variables, et cetera. Determination of sample size. This comes from your protocol or statistician. It's one of the most uh, well-written parts of the stat section in the protocol, so I would recommend taking it from there but comparing it with the statistical analysis plan to make sure that it's accurate and consistent. Here you describe the methodology by which the sample size was determined. And if they're not based on statistical calculations, you have to provide a justification. We see this, again, very often in phase one, where you use a small n, where, the, where it's just you can't really make a statistical conclusion from the small n that you have there, especially about things like efficacy. So um, there's just one or two sentences that go into the section that will come right from your protocol. Now, any additional subsections? Here, again, are where I think we need to add a few things. Interim analysis. Was one done? If so, we need a section for that. Did you have a data monitoring committee or a DSMB at some point? Uh, those I consider to be interim analyses, right? These are committees that are looking at your data at an, on an interim basis throughout the study. So if you had a DSMB or a data mon monitoring committee or an IBC, uh, that information should be provided here. And yes, again, it should be in your protocol. Other statistical or analytical issues. What else was planned before database lock? What else came up? Uh, and in some cases, uh, a section here, Procedure for Reviving the Statistical Analysis Plan. I find that kind of odd, but I know that it's required in certain countries. Now, 9.8, this is where things get a little tricky. This is where we say Section 10 really starts the back end, but 9.8, depending on how you decide to report things, um, could have actual things that happened rather than just what was planned. So the timing of changes is always important here. Protocol amendments, all amendments are going to be described here. Major changes are going to be listed, and any implications interpretations are going to be described here. But some protocol amendments happen well after the study started. So although we still consider it part of the front end, you know, it sometimes will have an effect on the data. And you might not be able to discuss this until you have the data. So some of these implications and text around that might have. Uh, and the, this other section, 9.8.2, other changes in the conduct of the study. Uh, if there's no other changes, no subsections are needed here. Um, usually statistical information goes here. Some people put protocol deviations here. I think it should go in section 10 because it's what happened versus what was planned. But some people, for some reason, want to put it here because it's considered a change in the conduct of the study when the protocol was deviated against. There's no right or wrong here. You can. But this, again, is where you might have some back-end information uh, in the front end of the, of the CSR. OK, knowledge check number four. You should use protocol text verbatim with tense changes only. You should not approve upon it for clarity. The green check for true and the red X for false. Excellent. That is false. Good job. Okay, so this is where we start talking about the back end. Let's talk about the back end. So we've talked for a very long time now about the front end or the shell, which is what we plan. The back end is really what we did. So now we're going to really talk about how we write evaluations for the safety, efficacy, PK, PD, whatever uh, information we have generated. ICH E3, this is sections 10 to 16. 16 are your appendices. But we're really primarily going to talk about 10 to 13, but I'll go over sections 14 and 16 to explain why, what those are about. All right, so our data or statistical output. This is when it gets kind of fun because you really start to get into investigation and really figuring out what happened. 
So it could be any combination of safety, efficacy, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. And we get what we typically call TLFs or TLGs, which are tables, listings, figures, or tables, listings, graphs. The tables are usually presented in Section 14, and they're numbered accordingly. They're numbered at every, every table should be numbered Section 14. These are your summaries. We're talking about how the data are presented before, right, and how we describe that in the, in the statistical section. And we would say that, you know, uh, summary statistics would be provided in table format. This is what we're talking here. It's all in tabular format. And these are used in the text sections of your CSR. So let's, talk, let's just look really quickly at 14 so you can see that what happens in 14 is we list every table that was generated. Now this came from an actual CSR. And you can see, let's just look at the heading for a minute. Table, so section 14.1, all of these tables start with 14.1, right? So they're generated specifically because they have to deal with demographics. This next page, 14.2, this is the efficacy data. And all of these are 14.2, so they should, hopefully be generated with table numbers that apply to the section that they're going into. You can see that there's a lot of efficacy data for this study. We're on page four now, okay? This is a very large phase three oncology study. Now, uh, oops, let's go back to 14.3. 14.3 is safety data, and all of these, again, and you might see in here interspersed are figures, okay? you also see the figures are also labeled number, uh, na number to the 14. The only thing you might see differently is some listings are here. We have a section in here for narratives. And all this one, although this one uh, just refers to the CIOMS reports, typically narratives are going to go here. And we'll talk about that when we get to section 12. So this is what section 14 is really going to look like, okay? And you can see this, you know, this is, this is 12 pages of just listing the tables. It's a pretty big study with a lot of data that are generated. And you can see that there's a lot to look at and a lot to go through and a lot to sort of sort out, okay? The figures also are section 14. It's really sometimes study dependent or phase dependent as to whether you, you're going to see a lot of figures or not. I find that in chronic disease, we see a lot of figures. Uh, oncology, things like myasthenia grave, you know, anything that's a, a, a chronic disease, you really want to chart the progression or course of things. And especially when they're very long studies like this, you want to ch chart things that happen over time. So you're going to see a lot more figures there. And you're going to see a lot of figures in phase one because we collect a lot of pharmacokinetic data. So you really want to see, it's usually when you see progression over time. So any study that has some progression over time that's a significant uh, output, you're going to see figures for this. Section 16 is your listings. These are your bi-subject listings. Your section 16 really actually also includes all of your appendices. So your listings are going to fall into uh, typically here, 16.2, and they're going to follow the same kind of course like the tables did, where the data listings uh, are going to usually start with a 16.2. Your protocol violations listing is going to start with 16.2.2, things like that. Demographics, 16.2.4. So your numbering should coincide for both 14 and 16 with exactly uh, where they're going to be placed in the report. So basically, let's talk about the tables. Basically, tables are what we're going to use for the body of the report primarily. These are summaries of the analyzed data. These are always provided they're the meat of your back end because what you're going to report primarily is going to come from the tables with the serious AEs or any kind of specific laboratory AEs. So the only time we really tend to look at the listings in the back end, other than referring the readers to it, is for significant events. So these tables could be very small. You might have have a total of 50 pages of tables like in a phase one study or thousands of pages like I just showed you with that one that had 12 pages just listing what the tables themselves were. We recreate these tables in the back end of the CSR. It used to be that we did it by hand. So we would manually take the table as it was reported out. It came out in an ASCII file and, and from the SAS uh, data sets and uh, we got this output and we would literally create tables and type all the data in. Luckily, that's changed now, and for the most part, we get this as an RTF or a Word document, and we can just cut and paste. 
which saves a lot of time and saves a lot of typographical errors and makes our QC people a lot happier because they find a lot fewer issues. Um, and we do like to make our QC people happy. <laughs> but they are recreated in some way, some methodology. And the size is going to vary. Some tables are really small, like a one-page or even a half-page table like subject disposition. Adverse event tables, however, can be pages long. So we've gone over the table numbering and naming. The naming should really specify exactly what is in the table. Uh, again, there's no, it's not prose. We, we, it's all about inf informing. So some of the table titles are going to be very long because it's going to be very clear about the information that, that's in there, especially when you get into efficacy. Uh, you want to work with your statistical group and generate standards so that they follow the appropriate, at least the numbering format. Now, if you've started a shell, uh, you can put representative tables, in, uh, and, and that's you know, going to come from what you think they're going to look like. If you've got the Word tables or RTF tables provided, that's great. If not, you're going to have to recreate them yourself, and one-page tables are very easy. Multiple page tables are more difficult with a lot more uh, possibilities for transcription errors. Uh, this is what the output tends to look like uh, if you're doing them yourself manually. This is a one-page table, patient disposition. Some of my grid lines got lost here, so I apologize for that, um, but normally they're all there. <laughs> and that is exactly what is in this table here. It was just manually created for, for this uh, table. Now for figures or graphs, they're exactly what they sound like. They're graphical representations of the analyzed data. Sometimes they're provided, sometimes they're not. We talked about where you're going to start to see them more frequently already. And these typically can just be cut and pasted in you know, the CSR when appropriate. Now, you have to decide which ones are you going to add. Not all of them. Typically, you don't use all of them, but in a PK study, you're going to get a lot of different things. You're going to get some things that are just uh, an individual subject data. And unless there's something unique or special about that particular subject, you're not typically going to put those figures in. But you're going to get them. You're going to see them in the output. What I will say is we almost always see figures for efficacy and PK. We don't see them as frequently for safety, but they do happen. But primarily you're going to see them for efficacy and those types of outputs or PK. Now the listings. The listings are not summaries of data. They are all of the data. It's everything that's collected and they're literally line by line by line. And these are used to confirm specific data in the back end. Specifically, we use them for serious adverse events. And when we talk about SAE narratives, I'll explain a little more about that. When we want to describe medical history, sometimes we look in there to see any kind of specific things that might uh, pop out. Laboratory uh, adverse events and normal ranges, if you see that there's some shift in some kind of specific clinical laboratory evaluation, for instance, maybe one of the hematology parameters has gone way up, maybe there's a lot of increased white blood cells, you might go to the listings to start to see what has happened. Is there, you know, are there one or two people and how big is the variation? And normal ranges for, for most of uh, the laboratory evaluations are often put into the listings. So when you're writing things about how things have or have not shifted, then you want to make sure that, um, you know, that you, you have access to those normal ranges. So the listing numbering we've talked about, naming again has to be very specific to what's in the listing. And again, you want to review the draft output, you want to work with your statistical group, and generate standards for all clinical study reports. Okay, knowledge check number five. Tables and listings are used for all sections of the CSR, but figures are not often generated for safety data. The green check for true and the red X for false. Very good, that is true. Okay, so now what? You've got data. Woo, very exciting, right? <laughs> well, as we discussed, you have to generate the tables if they're not already provided for you. And there are a lot of tables. Why? Because this is how we get a good snapshot of the data. As I talked about earlier on, thinking about why you might, might want to use a table format somewhere, if there are a lot of data, the best way to describe it is to put it in a table and have everybody be able to see it, compare it, uh, take a look at all of it side by side. What you do, though, after you put the tables in is you review and describe the results based on the data that you have. And one thing that you have to remember is that every table listing and figure that was generated should be referred to with some kind of a blue text link so that if, let's say I'm talking about adverse events, 
I may not provide all of the data, right? I'm certainly not going to provide the listings in there. If there are any figures for some reason about adverse events, I may or may not put them in the data. But I want the reviewer to know that they exist and they can look for them. And so you always want to provide a link uh, to each thing that refers to that category that you're talking about in your subsections of your, of your back end of your CSR. So it's going to look something like this. Here is a representative table. Summary of study termination status, all randomized subjects. It's appropriately formatted. There are no abbreviations, so we don't have to worry about that. But we've got our footnotes. We have our source. This table was taken from this information, table 14.1.1.4 and 16.1.2. So we always in the CSR, in the back end, when we are putting these tables in, we list what our source is. And then we refer the reader to where they can find additional information about study termination. And that information can be, can be found 16.1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.5, respectively, based on eligibility criteria, inclusion, exclusion, enrollment status, et cetera. OK. Hopefully that makes sense. So the back end is going to look like this, sections 10 through 16. We talk about the subjects or the population. We talk about the efficacy evaluation and the safety. Then we have a discussion and overall conclusions. 14 is tables, figures, and graphs, or fig uh, this should be tables, figures, and listings, I'm sorry, referred to but not included in the, oh no, tables and figures referred to but not included in the text. Then your reference list, and then your appendices. In 14 also, we're going to have SAE narratives, and we'll talk about them as well. Okay, section 10. 10.1 is where we describe subject disposition. In most of these sections now, we're going to have tables, one or more tables, and text. A figure, if it's appropriate. What we describe in subject dis disposition is who was in the study, at which times, when and why they discontinued, and they're usually grouped by treatment. Now here's where I said I like to put protocol deviations. It could go in 9.8. It's really up to you. Again, be consistent however you do it. This is in a variable format. It really depends on how the data are given to you. What you really want to talk about here is the important deviations. What are related to inclusion-exclusion criteria, study conduct, subject management or assessment, things like that. You will define what, you've, what you describe as a major uh, protocol deviation, and those are the things you're going you're gonna to talk here. And you're going to summarize in the text subjects in the study who weren't eligible, uh, maybe who were, were not withdrawn but should have been if they got incorrect treatments or doses or took excluded meds, things like that. So whatever you have determined is a major protocol deviation, You'll really talk about how many subjects it, it happened to, you know, numbers and percents, things of that nature. You're going to get this information in variable format. You should have a listing. Uh, depending on who's running the study, you might, there might be a deviations log. So uh, you want to make sure those are consistent in your appendices, and you want to uh, make sure that the data uh, are accurate for what you report. Now, the efficacy evaluation really is broken down into a few sections. The data sets that were analyzed. We already talked about our data sets or data populations. We defined them. We're going to talk now about the ones that we are actually using for analysis. Uh, demographic and other baseline characteristics, measurements of treatment compliance, and efficacy results and tabulations of individual subject data. So efficacy evaluation. As I said previously, we don't always see this. Maybe it's not. Maybe we're doing an abbreviated report and we're only doing safety. Maybe it's a PK study and efficacy, it's phase one and there's no efficacy. There's just no way that you're going to be able to even have a clue about efficacy in 10 subjects or 12 subjects. Phase three studies, however, it's going to be pretty big. Um, there are a lot of efficacy data that are generated and a lot, uh, very often a lot to talk about. Uh, one table for each one of these sections, but you never know. Some have more, some have uh, a lot. It really depends on how you're organizing. It should match the data sets defined in 9.7.1.2. Oh, I'm sorry, this one table has to do with data sets. My apologies. Um, E3 does not include 9.7.1.2. Uh, you can define it here if you're preferred. That's where we talked about the analysis populations. I like to put it in 9.7.1.2 because I like to talk about what was planned, and that's what was planned. But it's up to you if you want to put it in both places. But you do have to talk about which subjects were included in the analysis. And very, uh, you have a lot of data sets and you analyze the data, but you don't report everything in the CSR. You might just for instance, do a full analysis set, and that's what the data that you report in the CSR, and then you refer the reader, the reader or the reviewer to the per protocol population. So they aren't necessarily always the same, your analysis sets or your analysis populations. You want to make sure you define all of the ones that data were analyzed for, 
but when you're talking about the data that you're actually reporting in the CSR, you have to be really clear about which ones you're reporting and which ones you're referring the reader to. So here's an example of some text that describes what has happened in this particular study. And this is the table. There's one small table. And this is a pretty good example, I think. And you can see the format is always the same. We have our abbreviations, we have our footnotes, and we have our source. OK, demographic and other baseline characteristics is the section. It should be. Uh, Oh, no, 11.2, we're in efficacy. My apologies. One or two tables typically go here. Sometimes we break down demographic and baseline characteristics into two different tables, depending on how many we have. Some studies in chronic diseases have a lot of baseline characteristics that they're following. So you may not be able to put it into one table, or it may not flow well in one table. You may want to talk about demographics first and then your other baseline characteristics that may be related, perhaps, to the disease, et cetera. This could include uh, age, sex, and race as your demographics, disease factors. All of this stuff is really based on entry criteria, however, so keep that in mind here. Factors affecting response to treatment, anything else that happened at baseline, smoking, alcohol intake, special diet, et cetera. Some people include concomitant meds here as well, uh, or prior meds even. Um, I usually put it a little later. So here we're going to summarize by treatment group and time interval, if appropriate. And you might want to put comments here. It's a personal preference where you put in one table or text only. Open label studies may not have an analysis. And if that's the case, you want to state it and justify it. Section 11.4, this is broken down into a number of different sections. And most of this, gratefully for our writers, comes from your statistical analysis report. This is where we talk about individual subject data. We talk about certain things about analysis of efficacy, statistical and analytical issues, all these tabulations of individual response data. So a lot of this stuff really comes from your, from your statistical group. The analysis of efficacy, of course, we're going we're gonna to put in all of those information ourselves. But some of this other stuff is going to come from your SAP. So obviously, if you didn't evaluate efficacy, you're going to just put some kind of a uh, uh, statement in there, no efficacy evaluations were completed in this study. I recommend keeping the efficacy section there just so that it's clear that you didn't somehow inadvertently leave it out or something. But there are recommended subsections here, primary, secondary, and exploratory. And typically you're going to have a table for each of these, um, of these uh, objectives, figures if appropriate. Text, when you talk about any kind of information in a table, the text that you use is really you just want to focus on key or important information. You don't want to report every little thing that was reported in the table. Otherwise, you don't need the table. That's the whole purpose of the table is to impart a lot of information in a small area. So all you really want to do is call out the key information. That's the most critical thing to do. You want to describe similarities and differences. That's always important, especially between treatment groups. If there are important differences between the treatment groups that may affect the outcome of the data, it's important to describe that. So this section comes almost exclusively from your, from your SAP, adjustments for covariates, handling of dropouts or missing data. This is exactly what happened. So you put it in here from the SAP and you have your statistician make sure this is really what we did. Um, so you want to make sure that you're effectively showing what actually happened within the study. So I don't go into these in too much detail. Statistical and analytical issues, another section we rely on the SAP here. The SAP should mirror the CSR template if it's well written. Again, this is where all these interdependencies come in with the documents, right? The protocol should mirror the, the CSR template, and the SAP template should mirror this as well, so that you're really pulling data from the right sections from the SAP. Uh, you want to work with your stats group and know which things to discuss in the text. Were there statistical and analytical issues? If so, what happened, and how did we handle it? But typically, it's usually a short one paragraph explanation where we talk about the major features. Um, what's very important is to talk about if there was a breaking of the blind for any reason, what happened to the analysis? How did it change what was done? OK, 11.4.3, tabulation of individual response data. Typically, this is, this is really too big to include. So we usually refer people to Appendix 16.2.6 6, .6 and you, some kind of text that states individual response data were tabulated and are available upon request, something of this nature. So they know where to go. They have an appendix, and, they, and all of these data anyway are supplied separately in the submission to the agency at some point. 
drug dose, drug concentration, drug concentration and relationships to response. Uh, so when an individual subject dose can vary, actual dose is shown should definitely be tabulated and you should definitely uh, describe this in your CSR. If there was a PK analysis done, typically we're going to refer them to the PK section, which is going to come after uh, efficacy and safety or however you or organize it. Uh, 11.5 is not in your guidance, but I recommend that it be in your template because you can always take it out. Um, but the guidance doesn't really add a section for PK results. So uh, PK stuff should really all be done in the same, should be reported in the same section. You can also state that no formal analysis was performed if, in fact, that's true. Drug, drug, and drug disease interactions. If there is some kind of apparent response that has been uh, either uh, elucidated from the data or if you actually looked at this specifically, then this should be definitely reported. Uh, so any relationship between a response and some kind of concomitant medication or past or concurrent illness should be described. You can also state no formal analysis was performed. And a lot of studies, that, that's the case. By patient displays, this is where you really put individual subject profiles that are of specific interest, where something significant has occurred in one or more subjects. Typically, these are figures that are going to show something that happened over time, maybe a PK profile or some kind of uh, response to treatment, et cetera. So you're going, to sh it, you're going to show certain values of parameters over time. It may be combined with the course of a drug dose, an adverse event, some kind of concomitant treatment. Um, but remember, this is not for pure safety data because we're in the efficacy section here. So if there's something that has to do with safety, that goes in the safety section. So by patient displays here really just for efficacy. Then we get to conclusions. Now, if we're adding 11.5, which is our PKPD section, you have to really decide if you want to do efficacy conclusions separately, PKPD conclusions separately, or one big conclusion section overall. I think it's best to do for each, but I have seen people do it uh, another way. Again, whatever you choose, be consistent. Typically, reviewers like to see efficacy conclusions in, or any conclusions in bullet points. Uh, I used to think it made more sense to write it in you know, just all text and no bullets, but it does really help to focus a reviewer on specific points, and I've kind of come around to the bullet point thing. But the industry standard is bullet points, so that's what I recommend regardless. It does make things very concise. You really want to make sure that you talk about all your endpoints, but specifically your primary and secondary efficacy endpoints, what statistical approach was used or how it, was, how it affected things, uh, and if there were any exploratory analyses, you're just going to uh, bullet point all your conclusions. Now, election, uh, sections 11.5 and 11.6, if you add them, which is your PKPD section and your conclusions for them, you only have to do the data. You don't have to add all those additional efficacy, efficacy sec subsections that we had, like multiplicities and uh, things for you know, multi-center studies, et cetera. You only do that section one. So here, we just really talk about the data. What are the results? So if you have PK or PD or both, you add it here. You can break it down further if you want, or you can make it just PK if that's all you have. You have a lot of, li uh, like a lot of liberties here. Uh, and then I would put, again, I would put separate conclusions here rather than combine efficacy and PK conclusions. Okay. Now let's check number six. You must include a PKPD results section in your template according to ICH E3. The green check for true and the red X for false. Very good, that is false. Actually, it doesn't require it in ICHE 6. That's why we're adding section 11.5 there. Okay, safety evaluation. This is ICHE 3 section 12. As I've said before, all studies have safety, especially if you have an abbreviated report where you're not maybe reporting efficacy or PK or any other things. You're always going to report safety. The agencies always want to know, you know what kinds of safety information you found out about your drug, and you can't not report it. This is more standardized than efficacy, uh, and when I say the results are less variable, what I mean is by the presentation. For efficacy, you're looking at a lot of different endpoints. You're going to, you know, each study might be different. One might have PK endpoints. One might have some other kind of efficacy variable or endpoints. So that's a little different for each study in, in one program. But safety, you're always going to have the same types of displays. The data will change, of course but the displays are going to be consistently done throughout, unless there is some really major sort of uh, safety issue that comes up. This is a big section. It has very big tables. 
And there are three types of analysis and displays that we primarily use here. The summaries or the tables uh, are very important here. We also go to the listings much more in safety because we have to write um, SAE narratives and we have to follow up on individual lab results and individual medical histories or surgical histories and things like that. So this section is broken down into these six sections, extent of exposure, AEs, deaths, other serious adverse events, and other significant adverse events, clinical laboratory evaluations, basically all your other observations related to safety, and then your conclusions. So extent of exposure, typically this is one table, small table by treatment group. And you want to make sure that your exposure is characterized by number of subjects, dose, duration of exposure, or drug concentration. And you're going to have these summary statistics with the number and percentage of subjects in various categories. Typically, the safety population is, at le is anyone who has received at least one dose of study drug, regardless of whether they had any kind of assessments done at all. If they got drug and then walked away and you never saw them again, they're still in the safety analysis. So if there's a change from that definition, you want to provide an explanation. 12.2 is broken down into these sections where we really talk specifically now about the adverse events. We talked about how much drug they were exposed to. Now we're going to talk about adverse events. You get a, a brief summary, a display, an analysis, and listing of adverse events by subjects. This is often deleted. It's very redundant, so we don't really uh, keep it here, but at the very least you're going to refer to it in the, you know, refer to the listings in the text. Uh, so brief summary. This is basically an overall summary of the AE profile, if you will, for the study. So there might be a, an overview table that shows you this kind of information. If so, you want to include that. And this would be the type of text that you would talk about or that you would write, where you talk about what is provided in a certain table, where the, what the incidence of AEs was overall, uh, incidence of treatment related. Uh, AEs, and when we talk about TEAEs, if you're not familiar with this term, this is treatment emergent AEs. We don't really just talk about AEs anymore. We talk about TEAEs, what actually happened uh, during treatment. And then incidents of severe, you know, what kind of uh, severity happened. So we really talk about incidents of, of adverse events that we see, those that were treatment related, and what the overall severities were. Then we, talk, uh, we go to display of adverse events. And now we talk about which phase of the study these are being reported in. You know, are we talking about, uh, you know, the treatment phase, the maintenance phase? Some, sometimes things are broken up into different pieces in your study, so you want to be very clear about what you're reporting. Is there a percentage cutoff? There are so many AEs that are usually uh, reported, especially in large phase three studies, that sometimes there's a cutoff. The study team needs to determine this. You can't just... Uh, Decide on your own anecdotally. Okay, this is what I'm going to pick. I'm going to, you know, just going to, I'm choosing this. So sometimes it might be greater than or equal to 2%. I've seen it as high as greater than or equal to 10%. It really depends on the indication, what's important, what needs to be shown, and how many AEs were reported. The tables are presented typically by system, organ, class, and preferred term. And you want, typically want to present these in decreasing order of frequency, and your tables hopefully are coming out in this order. Uh, for system organ class, you should have the number and percentage of subjects with uh, adverse events in that system organ class. And again, this should be in your table already. You want to talk in the text really about the most frequently occurring AEs, any differences among the groups in the incidence of those AEs and any that might have a special clinical impact. So, and this you should be sort of already looking for and have discussed with the team. What kinds of AEs might have real impact on the drug, uh, how the drug works in the population, et cetera. Uh, and there are also AEs that are expected for certain classes of drugs, and you should be prepared to discuss them as well. You know, for instance, in oncology, we're very familiar with chemo drugs. Uh, that they cause things like nausea, vomiting, hair loss, things of that nature. So you, you definitely want to talk about what that was like for, for your drug, especially if the profile is better than what's out there. That's always a, a bonus. But you can't not talk about it if it's not better. You still have to talk about it regardless. Uh, and any important findings that fall below a percentage cutoff, so let's say you cut it off at 5%, but there are important findings in a smaller percentage, you still have to talk about them. You're always going to include a reference to the tables in Section 14 for the summary of all the TEAEs. 
The next section, analysis of adverse events. How is this different than what we just talked about, right? We just talked about all these incidents of adverse events and how frequently they occurred and how many subjects. Well, this is where we talk about how severe they were and whether or not they're related to drug. So you're going to have the same type of text, the same type of introductory text, and you might even have the same cutoff, but it's a different focus. That before we were talking about how frequent they were, now we're talking about which ones were uh, maybe more severe than others, how severe were they, and which were related to or considered related to your intervention. Section 12.3, deaths, other serious AEs, and other significant adverse events. We want to pay special attention to these. These listings are typically presented in uh, tabular format, so they're called listings, but they're actually tables. So when I showed you Section 14, what it looked like, and I, and I showed that you there were some listings there, it's because they actually do come from the listings. And that is what they are. They're listings, but they're sort of in a table format. Um, this is probably the only place in the CSR where we're going to see listings that are presented in tabular format, which is what it has to do with AEs. This, this section is broken down into three subsections, which is the listing of deaths, narratives of deaths, and analysis and discussion of deaths, and, of course, you know, other, other SAEs and other significant AEs. So you're going to have a table in 12.3.1 that is going to be that listing of deaths. And you may have to add additional information there that comes from other listings. It really depends on what you want to create. Other serious AEs uh, will probably have its own table. So we, sp we split out deaths separately, other serious AEs, and then anything else that's significant but not considered serious, which oftentimes is things like discontinued uh, due, to, due to an AE. Uh, that's a very common uh, significant AE. And also sometimes laboratory AEs that are not necessarily considered SAEs but are considered clinically significant. So in Section 12.3.1, you want to choose your appropriate format. Uh, always going to want to put a table in here. Good news is a lot of these tables, a lot of these are already in table format, but the death tables may or may not have it. So we put that we we actually just talk about deaths in this section and uh, a table if it's necessary. If there are no deaths or maybe one or two deaths, you might just want to describe it in the text. Uh, it really depends again on what the data show and how much you want to talk about it. Other serious events. This again is all SAEs other than deaths. So you would have a table here as well, and you would talk about these. SAEs, and you would link them not only to the tables and listings, but you would also link them to the SAE narratives. And then other significant adverse events, marked laboratory abnormalities other than lab SAEs, anything that leads to an intervention including discontinuation of drug is often put here. So this is your Table 16, listing of adverse events leading to death. This is an example. It's Table 16 here in this, in the, in the I'm sorry, in the example that I used. And you can see that it's going to look something like this. You're going to talk about which subject it is, some of their demographic characteristics, when the death occurred, the, the date and the study day. You might use one, you might use both, it depends. Last dose before death, cause of death, um, start date of the AE, relationship to drug, duration of treatment, uh, et cetera. So this is the kind of information we're going to put into that section. Now we'll talk about narratives of deaths, other SAEs, and certain other significant adverse events. Now it's interesting the way this is set up. In section 12.3.2, we have this whole section for narratives, but the narratives typically go in section 14. The reason is because very often we have a large number of patients with SAEs, especially if you're talking about oncology, again, these chronic diseases, uh, these patients are gonna have serious adverse events. Whether or not they're related to study drug is irrelevant, we're going to have to write them up. If you have 100 subjects or patients with SAEs, and those narratives can take up to anywhere between one and three pages each, we're talking 100 to 300 additional pages. So when you have SAE narratives that are that large, you refer them to section 14 where these go, and that's exactly where you put those narratives. And the reviewer just goes there to read them. And you can put a brief, uh, introductory paragraph here. If you've just got one or two, it might make sense to leave them here. So you have some flexibility. What I really like about the narratives is this is the most creative part of, of regulatory writing that I think we do in anything. You really get to tell a complete story and you're really investigating. So they're, I find them a lot of fun to write. Some people don't like to write them. I think they're really fun. Um, 
you have to go through the listings, the tables, everything, gather all the information, and write an actual story about what has happened clinically to the patient through the study uh, focused on that specific one or more uh, serious adverse events. So there's also questions always about what if somebody has more than one uh, SAE? What if they've got three? Do we write one narrative for each serious adverse event, or do we write one per subject? The industry standard is to write one per subject because a lot of times they overlap, so you really want to have a, a, a true sort of storytelling of what had happened. But there are still some people who prefer to do one narrative per SAE. And again, you know what I'm going to say here? <laughs> the path you choose, be consistent. Or if you change, change for everyone and change for all of your documents. So be consistent until you have a new process, but once you institute that process, make it consistent throughout. You extensively use the listings here. You're going to go to medical history, surgical history, demographics, adverse events, any, all, almost all the adverse event listings, death listings, all kinds of things are really going to go into, into this. Uh, I, I, I will show you the template for the narratives that um, I like to use. This one, again, this is for oncology studies, where we list every subject that has uh, a narrative and we describe what the narrative it's about, some have more than one reason. We have instructional text, of course, uh, into this. And then we, sometimes we break it up into a number of different categories. It's, it's really up to you how you do that. And then we have a table for each narrative as well that gives an overview. Following the table, we start talking about the demographics, what they initially entered the study with, what they were diagnosed with, et cetera. And then we start talking in about the SAE itself. Sometimes if there are a lot of laboratory information, you'll generate a table here. And this table is a table you generate from the data. It's not going to be, there's no t specific table for subjects for all this kind of stuff. So you have to actually generate it from listings. And then you go on to the next thing. So that's what a narrative sort of looks like, if you're not familiar with them. Like I said, I really enjoy writing them. But you have to include all of the basic information that we sort of went over really briefly. Subject ID, age and sex, specifics of their disease characteristics, uh, relevant illnesses, past and present. And I, I want to highlight relevant. Uh, and there's always, there are always different kinds of, um, you know, plans for what is the right thing to do. Uh, everybody has their own uh, kind of opinion. For me, I think if it's relevant to the disease or any comorbidities, it goes here. Otherwise, we don't really need to know that they had a tonsillectomy, uh, you know, when they were a teenager or something, unless that's appropriate to the study. But you have to decide for, in, you know, in your company how you want your narratives to look, and then, again, just find a process and stick with it. Relevant medications, description, timing, intensity of, of the SAEs, and any kind of co potentially contributing events. There are also other things that we we t with the narratives, uh, which are the SIOMs and the MedWatch forms, and these are the things that uh, the investigators report from the sites. You also are going to get some information from there as well, and you have to make sure that, that the information isn't conflicting, and if it is, you have to have some resolution. So it's a lot of fun. It's really kind of cool, I think. Then we get to analysis and discussion of the deaths, other SAEs, and other significant adverse events, and this is where you look at a critical assessment of these results. You really talk about what happened, were there differences between the treatment groups, and understand the meaning of things that are specific to your compound or your intervention. Uh, you know, is progressive disease necessarily something that is unexpected? In some cases, when, when you have a, a, a life-threatening illness or a chronic illness that could lead to death, um, it's not necessarily considered uh, something of import, right? Some, if a bunch of people die in an oncology study from progressive disease, we still have to talk about that, though. It's still an SAE, and whether we write a narrative about it or not, that's a company-specific decision, uh, but we still have to talk about what happened to these patients. So, but it's, it's part of the disease process for a lot of the things we might be writing about. So there are expected SAEs. You discuss with your project team what works, and again, try to keep a consistent kind of process going. Additional sections, clinical laboratory evaluation. This is going to vary based on the phase of development, how far you are along, uh, what your compound is. So you really want to talk about the different types. You want to talk about your hematology results and whether there are any significant findings. 
your you know chemistry results and then there may be specific things for either your indication that you're looking at you know for instance you know if you're looking at you know when I was working in schizophrenia we looked at prolactin levels because a lot of the drugs caused increased prolactin so we would talk about that here as well so depend you have to know your compound or your interval. We don't uh, supply all individual listings here, obviously, just like in the other section. So there's text here. And again, you're going to refer to the reviewer to whatever information is applicable to this particular subheading. This section, evaluation of each laboratory parameter, you're going to refer to the SAP because the SAP is going to really tell you what particular individual laboratory parameters, or hopefully it tells you what you need to focus on. The study team is going to determine the in-text tables. What are you actually going to provide information on, and then what are you going to uh, give, give to the reviewer to look at? A lot of these tables are really large and cumbersome. So we, we try to use groupings like hematology, electrolytes, liver function tests, renal function tests, et cetera, and break things down that way. So this section is broken down into these individual sections, laboratory values over time, and this is where you really just talk about any changes from baseline. There are also individual subject changes where we have shift tables where sometimes figures are provided, especially if there is some kind of critical outlier or some specific information that needs to be discussed or described that is, has, has some clinical import. And then we talk about individual clinically significant abnormalities. These are typically in the SAE section, uh, so very often we will refer to uh, the previous section for then other, the next thing we talk about are vital signs, physical findings, and other observations. It could be um, ECGs. It could be any number of things that happen. This is presented similarly to the laboratory variables, so you're going to subdivide it into each type of uh, analysis that you're looking at. And obviously, you're going to pay attention to data that are not evaluated as efficacy variables here because it's safety. So efficacy should already be done and put aside. And anything that's considered to be an adverse event that wasn't described anywhere else goes here. Now your conclusions, you're going to use the same format. You're going to have uh, efficacy, you're, you know, bullets just like efficacy. You want to pay particular attention to anything that resulted in a dose change or affected treatment in any way, and the SAEs and anything leading to discontinuation. If you found something that, that shows there's an increased risk for patient safety, you must describe it any methods that were used to mitigate it or to monitor it, and uh, whether or not it might have impact on vulnerable patient populations. Very often we talk here about people with renal disease, for instance, if something comes up and you see that it uh, might have a problem in terms of being filtered through the kidneys or, or affects kidney functions. Discussion and con overall conclusions. So here we summarize the results. We're going to identify any new potential new or unexpected findings. We're going to discuss the clinical relevance and importance of the results. And we're going to treat it a lot like a publication discussion. You might actually even use references from published literature. But your conclusion should be defined in bullet format in the conclusion section. So the discussion really is where you talk about it more like things like a publication and conclusion should be defined. And I will say uh, that some companies prefer not to really look at this as uh, a true discussion section, and they really just want to put results. So you have to be very careful about what you add here. Um, it's very important also for regulators for anything that you provide in here really to be specific to the results. You don't want to editorialize or add any kind of marketing messages or anything in this type of a document. That is strictly forbidden. What you really want to do is make sure that it's results focused and has some kind of clinical relevance to what you're describing here. Okay, so we've talked about tables, figures, and graphs not referred to, uh, referred to but not included in the text. We talked about how they're numbered. So I've shown you 14.1, 14.2, et cetera. And it really breaks down into these different sections, as you saw already, section 14. So it's going to look a lot like this. Now, of course, if it's a small PK study, it's going to be much smaller. <laughs> Uh, okay, references. So what do we include? Any kind of references that were used in the protocol uh, introduction uh, should already come from the protocol and you can pull them out, but if you've added to the introduction, then you want to add uh, those references as well. Okay, that makes sense, obviously. If you added new references in the discussion section, 
Any information from a reference incorporated into any regulatory document must be properly cited. So it must come from a proper source, uh, manuscripts, abstracts, supplements, books, book chapters. Uh, a lot of our references come directly from websites now, uh, but they must be appropriate, citable, copyright proven references. So each type of reference that you use is going to be referenced differently, but stick with whatever style you have. And again, if you don't have a style guide, AMA Manual Style is a great reference for this kind of information as well. You want to include copies of important publications in these appendices. There's one appendix has to do with publications that have to do with the study. So if you've generated any publications from the data from the study that were even presented at a meeting or whatever, it goes into one and the other one is any kind of imp important publications that you think the agency would want to see. Um, you don't have to put them there, but at some point, but they have to be available if the agency asks for. Reference styles. There are a variety of reference styles to choose from. You know, you're probably familiar with this. Every indication has its own style. Uh, I worked in a company once where we were working on three different drugs for three different indications, and one of the writers said, well, this is a rheumatitis drug. Uh, a rheum uh, should, we, uh, should we use the American Rheumatology Association style? Uh, I'm going to say categorically that's a bad idea. As a company or as a division or whatever you're focused in, you should really pick one style and stick to it. I always use AMA style unless I have a client that would prefer a different style. Some people like APA. Um, I find that it's not as easy to work with, but you can still manage it. Uh, but managing references can be very challenging. You need to think about whether you're doing it manually or whether you're using some kind of a, a software package. Um, EndNote and RefMan, I think, are now one. Thomson Reuters owns both of them and has combined them. And I'm pretty sure the process is finished, or at least the first version of that has come out. Uh, so if you're using either of those, you're probably now using the combined one. Uh, they're great software packages. There are others as well. They're, these aren't the only ones. Uh, but there are limitations, so you have to be aware of them. Everybody who's working within the document, especially anybody who is going to be working on the references, must have access to your library, so that has to be on a shared drive or some way to access it. Uh, but they really do make managing these systems uh, and uh, managing the uh, references much easier. It automatically puts in uh, the reference into your bibliography or your reference section in the back and keeps track when you move things around so you don't end up citing the wrong reference, which you know, both, I'm sure many of us have had happen in the past. But whatever you use, make sure that you are consistent with it. If you are manually changing references, the information changes over time, uh, even as you're writing the document. So even if you're updating it and it's great, and then somebody might look at your introduction or your discussion section and move stuff around, and then your references move around. Make sure you don't lose track of what reference goes where, uh, because it's really not a good idea to cite the wrong reference. All literature must be in-house and available in case any regulatory agency requests it. Now we'll talk about the appendices a little more. I did speak about this early on. These are a big collaboration. You have to know up front who is collecting them, collating them, publishing them. That you're going to preface this, at, actually like the last page of your CSR is a list of all the appendices. It's that list that I showed you here, this appendices list. This is basically the last page or pages of your CSR. Okay? And this is, the reason this is in blue text is because this is going to be linked to each of these appendices. So anything you see in blue, is because it's showing that it's got to be linked. Very often tables of contents are, are colored blue too at some point because those are links to sections within your document. So you need to have all these available. Uh, even if they're not needed for the submission, you might want to have them available anyway. If you're doing global studies, some things that you put in appendices for some, some you don't need for others. For instance, a PI signature, you're going to need that for Europe even if you don't need it for the U.S. So make sure that you have a process in place. And one thing I'm going to caution you on, if you don't start this process in the beginning, it really can hold you up. I, I can't tell you enough times how important that is. It's a very long process, especially if you don't have a TMF. If you are a CRO, you're probably responsible for the TMF for your client. It's really a good idea to make sure that they have updates. If you're the sponsor uh, of your trial master file, you want to make sure that if you're working with the CRO, that you work with them to have a duplicate TMF electronically at the very least so that uh, you can keep each other 
uh, on top of things. It's a, it's a collaboration, right? We're a team. We all work together. Uh, there should be a cover page for each appendix or each section. Uh, you might have this as part of your template. If you don't, I would recommend you start to generate appendix cover pages because uh, there's a lot that goes into them. Some are very basic, some have a lot of information. If an appendix is not used, so let's say there are no publications for the study, uh, all you have to put in then is, is the cover page and note it on the cover page that it's not applicable. So the cover pages do have more to do uh, with, you know, the um, slide. Okay, so let's talk about the synopsis, because the synopsis is a big part of your CSR. This is an overview of what is found in the CSR text, and it has front-end and back-end similarity to the CSR text, just like you're, you're used to seeing. Uh, if you've written protocols or read protocols, you've seen the same kind of thing. It's usually in a table format. It's very important to make sure that you have a consistent format for this, just like any other uh, kind of synopsis that you would do. It's treated as standalone. So I want to talk a little bit about granularity, because this applies to the appendix as well. And if you're not familiar, um, uh, it's kind of important to understand. So let me just talk a little bit about granularity um, so that you have a greater understanding of why we're not linking, for instance, the appendices. We're just putting things in blue text. So especially if you're submitting electronically, or pr actually primarily if you're submitting electronically, everything that gets submitted goes on this XML backbone through a gateway. And everything has to be submitted in a PDF format in a certain, you know, there are certain conventions that are applied to the particular way that you create the PDF. And each of these things is submitted in what's called a granular fashion. I didn't really understand what that meant, but what it really means is that everything is sort of teased out and, and, and separate. So each appendix, for instance, is going to be one PDF file. So 16.1.1, this is one PDF file where you have a cover page and all your protocols and protocol amendments are included. Same with 16.1.2. This is your sample case report form. So your CRF is in here or whatever your data collection tool is, uh, and it's got a cover page as well. And as I go down these, it's all the same. So 16.1.3, list of independent IECs or IRBs. Now, by the way, the cover page for something like this would have that whole list as part of your cover page, typically. Or if not, it would be the first thing behind the cover page and then any other information that is required. Uh, your sample consent forms, et cetera, are all, this is all one PDF document. This, the same thing, 16.1.4, the list and description of investigators and other important participants. You would have a whole list of the investigators and then each one of those, at least for the PIs, uh, CVs and their medical licenses. Some people include the sub-investigators. There's a whole lot of discussion over what you include and what you don't. Signature page, this is uh, what I said came last, but each one of these is going to be submitted as one separate granular piece so that as it gets imported into the, uh, you know, the submission space, everything is done by linking. So I would click on this if I were actually in a, re in a reviewer uh, pane or something at the FDA, for instance, or uh, at the EMA or whatever regulatory agency. I would click on this and it would take me right to that appendix. But it's all supplied as separate PDF documents. Same thing with the synopsis. So you might generate the synopsis as part of your CSR uh, and go through the whole process of the whole CSR being approved, et cetera. But when it gets submitted, the synopsis comes out. Some companies actually do it separately. So remember when I talked about um, abbreviations and first use and I talked about doing uh, a first use in both? This is why. It's a separate document. But what it is basically is a snapshot of your CSR, just like the synopsis for a protocol is a snapshot for your protocol. So as you decide to write, as you are writing your CSR, typically we write the synopsis, we write the front end of the synopsis when we write the front end of the CSR, and we write the back end of the synopsis when we write the back end of the CSR. However you decide to send it around in your review cycles is up to uh, you. can send together as one document. You can send, you know, it's really however you do it in your company, and again, I recommend consistency. I prefer table format. It's the most widely used format. There is a header that goes on that is pretty standard, and I think it's important to kind of use that header if you can. Some people try to write it first. It's really hard to write it first if you don't have data. Um, and I typically recommend this for a protocol because it helps you define and, and, and figure out what you need for the protocol. 
Uh, you can actually, it can help you figure that out for the CSR as well, but I don't find it works as well. But that's just me. If you want to start it first, you can. It's really up to you and what process works best for you. Writing is a very personal kind of experience, I guess, and we all do it in ways that work specifically for us. So find what works for you. Now, uh, do you use it, do you not use it? I recommend using it. If you use it, you should probably do repeat and have it on all pages. There's nothing more frustrating, I think, than seeing a table without a header. It just feels kind of unfinished. But it contains this type of information, the name of the company, the name of the finished product, the name of the active ingredient, a section that refers to Module 5, which is where this document will actually live in the submission, uh, and a section for national authority use only. And that's another reason why I like to use the table header, because the national authority use, if they have some kind of comments they want to put in there, it, it's available to them. It looks like this, basically. Your name of your company, uh, name of the finished product, active ingredients, uh, assuming this applies to yours, referring to Module 5 of the dossier, and any kind of other national authority use. And you can modify this. I mean, some of this is going to start to be obsolete when we're not doing really volume in pages anymore. But it looks similar to this. The synopsis is based on this type of information. So you can see that it's really uh, a snapshot of the CSR. We start with our title, investigators, numbers of sites. We don't put all of them here, obviously. We might list how many investigators over how many investigative sites. Or maybe we say, uh, you know, for a small study, it might be, uh, a small multi-center study with four sites, but for a large global study, you might have any number of different countries and you might want to talk about how many sites per country, et cetera. Publications, this is usually publications uh, that are in your, that are about the study, so you would provide a reference to that. Uh, the study period, the phase of development, the objectives, your methodologies, Number of subjects, you want to talk about planned and enrolled. What did, what, what did you plan and what actually happened? Diagnosis, main criteria for inclusion. This is very important here. This is your eligibility criteria. Test treatment, dose, mode of administration, batch numbers. Um, this is all kind of important information too. What, what are you giving them or what is the intervention? Uh, how is it administered? Were there a bunch of different lots? How long were they uh, exposed to this treatment? How long was the treatment? You can talk about the whole study process. Usually we break it down to the screening period, uh, when they're on treatment, any follow-up, et cetera. And assessments, you should break this down into sections just like you do in the CSR. If there are any specific bioanalytical methods used, you want to elucidate them here, otherwise you can take this out. Your stats methods, you definitely want to talk very much more detailed than you might expect, uh, should go in here. Because anybody who's reading the synopsis should be able to understand everything that happened in the study. That's the basis for it. Some, uh, some regulatory agencies have some people just review synopses only, um, while other people in the agency review the full report. So somebody who's just reviewing the synopsis should be able to have an intelligent conversation with somebody who reviewed the, the entire report and make sure we're on the same page. Again, consistency is very important. Results, I would break again into efficacy, PK, safety, et cetera your conclusions, and then the date the report was finally issued. So those are critical things for your synopsis. The title you're going to take from the protocol. Again, we're going to go through a little more detail here because this is a very key piece of your document, so I want to make sure we're clear on this. Investigators and sites, for less than three sites, you're going to enter investigator names and degrees, city, state, province, country for each. For greater than three sites, you're going to list the PI and site information for that site, write something like multi-center, and list the country or countries and number of sites for each. That's the standard. Of course, you can do it a little differently, but this is really what's accepted and what the agencies are used to set. You can put none if there were no publications or cite the references for any publications based on the study. So you don't put your references here. This is only publications based on the study. The study period, really the start and end date. And you want to make sure you're consistent with date formats. And this goes throughout the whole document, not just for the synopsis. Um, I tend to like to have the month written out either in full or in this kind of format where, you know, it's just the first three letters. But when you write the month out, nobody gets confused about whether you're using U.S. or XUS nomenclature for dates. Um, so that helps, so what, and whatever date format you use, again, what am I going to say, be consistent <laughs> for every part of, of your documents. Always use the same type of format. It really makes a big difference. 
The same dates are going to be uh, used that are on the title page, so this should all be compared and contrasted and it should be the same for each. Uh, and it's what your definition is. What is, you know, is the start date the date of the first subject enrolled? Is the date of the first subject's written in form consent? So uh, this definition is usually actually written into this part of the synopsis so that it's clear. The phase of development, again, this is going to be consistent with the title page. Your objectives, you can copy directly from the protocol and change the tense or copy it from your CSR text depending on when you're generating this, um, but they should all be verbatim except for tense differences if you're looking at the protocol. Your methodology, you're going to summarize key aspects of the study design. Uh, this should be consistent with the CSR text, it doesn't have to be verbatim, um, and actually it's not required because the CSR text is going to be pretty long, so you don't want to you're not really copying the entire CSR in here, but you want to make sure that the context is the same and that you haven't left out any key information. So you're really going to talk about randomization, bias elimination methods, what types of control are you using, uh, what types of blinding are you using, and how many, you know, is it a multi-center or a single center, what study design, is it a parallel group study, is it a crossover design, things of that nature. Uh, you know, things that really tell somebody what happened in the study conduct. Number of subjects. Planned, enrolled, randomized. So you're going to talk about what was planned and what actually happened. And if you have it by treatment group, if, there, if that's the way your study is set up, um, it's always good to put that. Diagnosis and main, inclusion, main criteria for inclusion. There are a couple ways you can do the inclusion exclusion criteria. You can, it must match the protocol. It doesn't have to be verbatim. That's not required. You have to either write in text what the main inclusion and exclusion criteria are, or you might just copy the inclusion and exclusion criteria in their entirety. Uh, people do both. There's no one way that's better than another. Uh, but you want to make sure that you briefly describe the planned population and uh, specific key information at the very least. For test treatment, dose, mode of administration, and batch numbers, this is where you obviously talk about your study drug. Here you would talk about your device, if you had a device, for instance, and you describe it. For drug, we're going to talk about dosage form strength, route or mode of administration, and we're, going to, and we're going to add batch numbers here. If there are too many, you can always refer them to the appropriate. Some companies prefer that you don't refer to appendices in the synopsis. I don't really know the rationale for that. I just know that it's not preferred in some cases. Uh, but if there aren't too many, there's no reason why you can't keep them in the synopsis. Duration of treatment, what is the planned duration of treatment for each study phase and period as well as for the whole study? The assessments, you would copy a list of assessments from the protocol, you would change the verb tense, and you would break into sections. You don't have to go into too much detail here. You don't have to replicate the whole method section, basically. What you do have to talk about is what assessments were done. And if there's critical information that needs to be described about them, then you would put it in here. Sometimes it might be the, re the rationale for using that assessment, or there might be some key information about how things were evaluated that you would include here. But again, you're going to break these things down into the appropriate sections. For efficacy, if there, if there were no efficacy assessments, state not applicable. Otherwise, you're going to briefly describe what was done. Same thing for PK. Delete if no PK. Otherwise, briefly describe the procedures. You want to specify if there was sparse sampling or if, or, or if all subjects were assessed for PK. And uh, the number of samples over what period of time. So it might be, you know, over 24 hours each subject had 16 samples collected uh, and whatever type they are. For PD, again, you're going to delete if there was no pharmacodynamics. Or otherwise, you're going to briefly describe the pharmacodynamic, uh, the PD or biomarker measurements that were performed. So again, you're going to sort of go through the same thing with all of these. Uh, state not applicable or delete. State the main criteria if assessing for safety. Uh, if, if there are no other things that you want to point out, then you don't point them out. But otherwise, you would briefly describe any other assessments, quality of life, health economics, et cetera. Bioanalytical, bioanalytical methods, again, deleted if there aren't any. But otherwise, you just briefly describe the methodology used to quantitate stu uh, the study drug. Stat methods, you're going to summarize what you put in, in 9.7, but you're going to put enough detail in there that someone who is a statistician understands exactly what has happened in the study. You want to, you know, give attention to the main uh, 
criteria uh, that you're assessing in these patients, so efficacy, P PKPD safety, et cetera. If efficacy is your primary objective, you're going to focus heavily on that. You're going to include your sample size rationale for sure in here and identify the analysis that's used, at least the ones that were used for the primary analysis that you're including in the CSR. You have to talk about interim analyses if there were any and any other analyses that were performed to account for any kind of bias. And for the results, you're really going to use the summary information from the CSR text. Some people truncate this and just highlight major things. That Again, this is a company decision, but you want to include real data with p-values and numerical data as appropriate. You don't want to really cut out the key information. You want to make sure the actual results are there. Some people put key tables and figures in. I'm not a fan of this. I think it makes the synopsis very unwell. Many people disagree with me. Again, whatever you do, do be consistent with it. And again, I would break the results into sections. I would do efficacy, PKPD if you have it, safety uh, in that order. So it looks something like this, you know, subject disposition analysis sets, efficacy, summarize your findings from 11.6, PKPD, summarize your findings also from 11.6, or it might be 11.4 uh, 11 and 11.6. Uh, safety, again, summarize the main safety findings from 12.6. And you're always just going to point out any key issues and make sure that the synopsis is complete. Your conclusions, you typically would copy your conclusions from section 6.3. These are your overall conclusions. And you can summarize these or they can be verbatim. If they're really lengthy, again, summarization may be an appropriate thing, as long as the critical information that has to do with uh, clinical concerns are there. And then the data report, the date of the last signature, this much must match the report date on the title page. I know I went kind of fast through this, but it's a lot of information. People typically have a lot of questions about CSRs, um, particularly about ones that they're going to be writing. So uh, I thank you for your uh, really great attention. And I'm open for questions if you have any at this time. You can either chat them through on the chat panel. You can open up your lines and talk to me about them, whatever works for you. Okay, great.